Good evening. Welcome to Poker Night Live. My name's Lindsay and I'm joined by Matt Broughton tonight. Good evening. Hello. Your poker expert. I'm uh, doing my best for you. We're here with you till 2am watching live internet poker. Real games are being played online for real stakes. And of course, on Poker Night Live, it's fully interactive. It's your show and we do love to hear from you. It's amateur night tonight, so we want your questions. You can send them through to the studio. We want your texts and emails, you can text us. The number is 62211. There it is on the screen, 62211. Or you can email poker at pokernightlive.co.uk. Also, we are online. You can have a look at our website and find out all about the show. There's the web address, www.pokernightlive.co.uk. So it is amateur night tonight. Feel free to ask anything, even yeah. if you think it's really basic. From the very, very basic most questions to anything advanced. So whatever you want, we welcome your, your queries. Definitely. OK, so we're going to be watching some great poker tonight. It's a bit of cash. We've also got some sit-and-go tournaments and a good multi-table tournament. Big entry tonight, Yeah, we've we got about 350 runners tonight, so some juicy play. And we will, be, of course, be picking up at the final table at the, uh, towards the end of the show. Always very good action there. Excellent. So all that coming up. Would you like to take us around the tables, Matt? It would be my pleasure. OK, so the first table we have tonight, folks, uh, is indeed our green table of love. It's the multi-table tournament. We've got about 342 runners, I believe, here tonight. So going to be lots of action. We're going to keep dropping in on this as the night progresses. And as I said before, we'll end up on the final table to see the big boys going at it. Uh, on table two tonight, we have a, uh, a sit-and-go tournament. This is a $2 uh, entry fee here. So some, uh, some amateur guys giving it a go here before they step up the levels. But nice full table. So we'll come back to that very soon. We also have a $10 sit-and-go tournament here on table three. Again, only just got started by the look of the chip stacks there, so we will come back to this soon. Some familiar faces there to catch up with. And, of course, we don't just feature tournaments here. We are also going to be looking at the cash games. And here we see a $0.25, cents, $0.50 cents cash game going on. One seat free. Get it while it's hot. Yeah, good stuff. Lots to look at there throughout the night. Gonna yeah, be a lots, good and lots, show. Of, uh, lots and lots of action, lots of single table tournaments, the big multi table tournaments. Yeah. And a cash action as well. Looking forward to that. And it is your show, so whatever you want to talk about, that's what we'll talk about. So Absolutely. get in touch with us. We love to hear from you. You can text 62211 or email poker at pokernightlive.co.uk. OK, we're going to go to the MTT straight away, the okay. multi table tournament. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Right. So, ten dollars to buy into this tourney. Yep. There's uh, 342 people set down at the beginning of this uh, tournament. 30 of which will get paid. So it's a uh, it's a pretty large field to, to survive through. And to be really honest with you, you want to get onto that final table because that's where the money starts getting quite juicy. And the top prize tonight for only a ten dollar buy-in is nine hundred and forty dollars. That's good return for your money, is isn't it? Not too bad for a few hours work. Let's be honest, if you sat down on a cash table you couldn't expect that same sort of return. Uh, yeah, so the top three prizes, nine hundred and forty, five hundred and ninety eight, and three hundred and ninety three. So even the difference between those three places is huge. So there's none of this just sitting mm. back and trying to get in the money. You want to be in the big money. Because every place counts, money wise, definitely. Yeah, and it jumps up once you are in the uh, once you're off the bubble as it were, when you get into the money Every single uh, position makes quite a big difference, so uh, good luck to these guys. But early days yet, the blind's still here, only at 10.20, so we've only just got cracking. And as I said, we're going to keep jumping in and out of this as the, uh, as the evening progresses. So the blind's there at the top of the screen, uh, 10 and 20, but they'll be going up every 12 minutes in this tournament. Yes, indeed. So uh, it's fun, you know, many tournaments, they have a timing limit. It's quite on quick, that, isn't it? It depends. It it depends what kind of game. I mean, this is actually kind of ties into when people sort of ask us about what, you know, if I want to run my home game, what sort of blind should I do? And the truth is it's a case of experimenting. But normally, if you don't want to be sitting there all night long, you know, you're going to some of the big tournaments where it's, you know, a 30-minute blind or a 20-minute blind. But 10, 15-minute blinds are quite juicy because it means no one has the luxury of just sitting back and waiting for a pair of aces. Everyone's got to actually, like, play the cards yeah. they've got. So it's, it's not a bad thing. Um, and they all start with 1,500 chips. Yep. And I'm sure we're going to bounce into some familiar faces as we uh, go through the evening. But with 342 people to uh, pick between, we're going to see. I mean, you can see from the chip stacks here that there's not really no one making too many major moves at this stage. But a few injuries and a few people start to accumulate chips. Yeah. A couple and, uh, of people are quite short stacked as well. We've got JJ at the bottom there down to 660. Yeah, but there's still plenty of big blinds. It's still, 
It's still enough to do some damage with no uh, no panic stations at this stage. No, he's got a lot of play in him left because you should be looking at your your chip stack in relation to how many big blinds you've got left. Yeah, and also the table you're on because the thing is you've got to appreciate with multi-table tournaments is obviously like at any minute you could suddenly find yourself moved onto a table. The way that the multi-tables work, if you're not familiar, is that you start off with the maximum number of players on the maximum number of tables, and as people get knocked down, they break the tables down so you don't end up with one table with six players and another table with two players. Yeah. Obviously, they keep bringing the tables together until they can actually get rid of the tables. Yeah. So the only thing with the multi-table is you're getting yourself nice and comfortable, and you've got a couple of reeds on the players around you, and all of a sudden you get whisked away to a, for a table full of people you've never met before. So you've really got to look every single opportunity to, to try and accumulate chips. And, and quite rightly, as you say, you need to look at your chips compared to the blinds but also your chips compared to the players around you. Yeah. So even here, we're looking at JJ, who's only got 660, but to all the players on his table, that's still quite a sizable chunk. So if he suddenly decided to start making big raises or even going all in, even to our chip leader here, who's just under three grand, that's still quite a big... A chunk of his stack as yeah. well. He's not going to want to risk that much. Whereas if he was down to, say, 100 they'd, and, he, and he went all in, they'd be more, a lot more willing to call his all-in bet. Absolutely. And that's the problem with the tournaments is, you know, when you get to the stage where you're putting your tournament life on the line, you can't leave it too late because, as you say, if you wait until you've only got 100 to go all in for 100 somebody will probably just call you because it's not going to kill them if they lose and they stand the chance of knocking you out regardless of the hand, you know, the cards they're holding in their hand. So um, you've always got to be mindful not only of how many blinds but the players on your table. Because if JJ suddenly gets moved to another table where everyone's at 520, he might actually feel far more likely to be aggressive than here where pretty much everyone he can play against mm. has got him covered. So you've got to be really sort of quite quick to get reads on the players in, the, in these multi-table tournaments and then also be ready to adapt your game if you get moved onto another table where you know, maybe it's a lot tighter or a lot more aggressive, you have to be prepared to then change your yeah. style depending on the table. Yeah, well, it, it's one of the things where everyone gets a bit too wrapped up in, you know, how much of a, how much of a read you can take of your opponent online. Um, and, and the only problem is, as you say, you're never, never really there for that long, even if it was a sit-and-go sit and single-table tournament, is you really don't know how long you're going to be there. Yeah. Um, so if you get too wrapped up in trying to sort of build a table image or try and mm. get information out of your, your players, you're not there that long and you're also assuming that they're paying attention to their behaviour. If they're watching the telly and surfing the internet and playing at the same time, they might not be giving off signals. You're reading all these signals into yeah. their actions, but you're expecting that they're paying as much attention as you are. Um, but you're quite right. You get moved to a new table in the multi-table tournaments and you've got to very quickly try and suss out who's being aggressive, uh, who's making big moves. You find a lot of people when they're playing multi-table tournaments will open up other windows. They'll follow the chip leader yeah. thinking, if I end up sitting against this guy, I want to have a bit of a view. So while they're playing over here in their window, they've got another window open and they're just watching some of the other players in case they land against them. At the beginning of a tournament like this with about 350 players, that's a bit speculative, yeah. but when you get to those middle stages of the tournaments, when the key players are starting to emerge, that's when a little bit of homework can actually pay pretty good dividends. So it's always worth doing, and like we say, with the online systems, you're always able to bring up the little boxes and make notes about players. And if you do, a, you know, sense someone being fairly aggressive, make a note about them. Even if they're sitting with you on your first table, make any notes, because who's to say you won't end up on the, the single final table with you? And there, any information you've got might give you an edge over the other guy sitting on that table. And that's one thing we always say, the more prepared you are, Absolutely. you know, the you better. Want, <laughs> you know, the, to have the best cards is one edge, but to have information about the players, to have a better position, you know, every little edge you have gives you a more, you know, a better expectation mm -hmm. of actually performing in the tournament. So, you know, think about what you're doing. It might be, you know, 350 people and four hours to go, but who's to say these aren't the guys you're going to run into again in a while? If you've got information on them, it's going to help you. Yep, definitely. Okay, let's have another look back at the game. We're going to have a look at a cash game oh, okay. for a bit. Something oh, okay. a bit different. We'll be uh, okay. dipping into that multi-table tournament a little bit later on to see where wait. we're at. I can wait. <laughs> I'm in no hurry. I'm not going anywhere for a few hours. Well, those guys have to, you've got to have patience in those tournaments, haven't you? Because you could be playing for, like you said earlier, a few hours. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing is, you've got to find a, you've got to find a real balance between... In the old days, the kind of key bits of information you got as far as advice went with the, the big table tournaments was survival. Mm. But the only problem with survival is that doesn't sound like a very aggressive way of playing. So, you know, you've got to use those early, those early stages of the tournament. Still got to be looking for opportunities to actually, like, you know, pick up some chips. But here we are. We can see this cash game we just zoomed in on. Uh, well, we've got 
We've got a full spectrum of uh, money to play with. Somebody with sixpence down the bottom. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Snap it, a familiar, familiar face on Poker Night Live. Yeah, top of the leaderboard there at the moment. And of course, this being a 25 50 cents game, the maximum anyone can sit down with is 50 bucks. But still, even though it seems a very, very small stakes, there's still a lot of money that can be made on these tables. Sometimes go to them and they've, you know, they've made a fair few amount of dollars. Yeah, well, and again, obviously, we follow here the no limit game. So there's, well, as the name would suggest, there's no limit to the, the, the amount that can be made. So you've got a full table, eight players. Uh, if you get a nice big family pot where everyone's in it, and it's one of the things you can do, again, we talk about you know, being prepared, but when you come to the online lobbies, one of the statistics they always show you is what the average pot is. Yeah. And you can always tell a table full of grinders just sitting waiting for quality hands versus a kind of a more exciting table because the pots will vary. Some of the, you know, the average pot here is going to be five dollars. Then you look down to an identical setup game and the average pot's fifteen, twenty dollars. Yeah. You know that there's more guys happy to chuck their, their chips in. So that's something uh, for our new players to take note of. It's always worth, if you're going to enter especially a cash game, to, to look around first and to see you know, what, what the stacks are. Absolutely. And well, that's the thing is it's one of those things where if you're looking to kind of, you know, we, we get a lot of contact from players that have been playing on the play tables and they want to step up to the cash, uh, yeah. you know, is that if you're looking for a kind of a, a, slower, a slower game to sort of just settle down yeah. and pick your moments and get used to the systems, is that if you can see that there's a game where the average pot is pretty big, you know you're going to be running into some fairly aggressive players. Um, so yeah, I mean, make, make use of all the information. There's a lot of information that you get before you enter a game, and you can even just sit and watch a game for a while. Yeah. So there's never any harm, there's no rush, and we always say you're never gonna succeed in poker if you're ever up against the clock, if you've only got a short period of time to play, mm. or you wanna get straight into it. Uh, there was a fantastic guy who came and joined the table the other day we were watching, and the biggest tell was that he had only three hands to go. He, he sat down as a new player, he only had three hands to go before he would have been the big blind. Right. But he opted to post the big blind as soon as he sat down. Okay. And that just sort of shows you that this is a guy who's keen to play. Mm. He wants to get involved. You think maybe he's going to be a bit looser. Yeah. And it's such a small indication. But again, when you're trying to build up the edge, you just say, why is this guy in such a hurry to get involved in the hand? Yeah. What might that tell me about him? That he's prepared to, to waste. I mean, we're watching a 25 cent, 50 cent game, fair dues. But if this was a $100, $200 game, to sit down and immediately post $200 is a big blind because you can't wait to get involved. It's like when they say racehorses are really green, when they're straight out the stalls and don't pace themselves Absolutely. and that's it. They, and look, that's they show their, their youth and inexperience. Exactly, and most players would sit down and they're just going to wait till the blinds come round. Mm. They might deliberately sit down when there is that scenario because they want to watch their, kind of their, the guys on their table play for a while and yeah. try and pick up a bit of a, you know, be it online or live, just try and get a feel for the table and the speed and the other players. But the guys that sit down and immediately post the big blind Right, give me some cards, give me some cards, and you think, okay, well this, this yeah. is someone that, that I might kind of go up against if I think he might play less than premium hands. Yeah, so, but it does take time, effort, patience, all those things. You can't just expect to be a brilliant player overnight. No, and there's a lot, you know. We, you there's know, so much to learn, isn't there? There is, and, it, and you kind of have to take it in stages, and, and obviously we deal with this more on the, on the pro nights, but to start off with, you're worried about your hands. Yeah. And then once you've stopped worrying about that, you start kind of paying more attention to what might your opponents have, mm -hmm. which kind of sounds obvious, but a lot of people don't even, you know, they're not looking at that board and thinking somebody might have a flush because they're so in love with their three of yeah. a kind. And then you start appreciating the difference that position on the table makes. And the betting and, and the things betting, like that, yeah. And so, so there is a lot, but you, you know, it's like any, it's any, any sport or any hobby or anything you take, you take it a little bit of time, yeah. a little bit of time and you... You gradually, you know, you work your way up. So for a brand new player watching sort of tonight, someone's just tuned in, they think, ah, where do I start? Are, are they the, the things which, where you'd start? So if you can remember back to when you first started playing, you've been playing a long, long time now, what, the, what were the first things that you sort of took into consideration? Was, was it things like that you started with the hands, then what your opponents have, betting? Yeah, I guess the first thing, the first thing I used to sort of be aware of, and the, probably the first bit of advice I used to give at 21 was just see as many hands as you can, play as many hands as, especially here with, we always look at, you know, Texas Hold'em because it's the most popular game at the moment, is that when I started playing, if I had had, uh, you know, uh, Jay Bosch House down here, yeah. I would have played that because they're suited. Yes. I love suited cards. And the truth is, 
you know, it doesn't matter how many times, you know, Casper sits here or Dr. Tom sits here and says, all right, it's 118 to 1, so hit the flush, you know, blah, 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 how many outs have you got? Is that the truth is that if you don't feel that, mm. if you don't really understand it, somebody telling you, don't touch that kettle, it's yeah. hot. You, you know, you do actually have to touch the kettle a couple of times before you kind of go, right. You have to learn uh, from your mistakes. Exactly. And that's the truth of it, is that you have to play enough hands to start getting a feel. And I'm a big, I'm a big believer, I'm not really much of a walking calculator. I don't work on pure maths. Yeah. I kind of know what the maths is, but it's much more for me about knowing the likeliness. Yeah. When, when I'm sitting waiting for one car to make my gut shot draw, and it's the, it's the only car that's going to make my straight. Yeah. Somebody bets into me, I know whether that is worth pursuing or not. Yeah. It's not like I've got it all written down and I know exactly how many outs I have and how much percentage to give it. But you know it's an instinct that that's... Yeah, and you do it, but the only way you get that is by playing hands, playing hands, playing hands. Mm. So that was really, for me, probably the first thing I did was to start to appreciate that 10 jack isn't much of a hand. Yeah. What is it beating? What sort of a flop do you want to see to still like 10 jack? And that sounds really ludicrous, but those, I used to actually physically ask myself the questions, like just say, you know, what am I hoping to see here? Yeah. And it's like people that have problems, they get attached to pocket, you know, it's snap, it's got a pair of sevens, looks great, it's the strongest hand at the table right now, but what will it take to make him no longer like the seven? Yeah. If an eight, a nine, a 10, a jack, a queen, a king, or an ace come down on the flop, all of a sudden he can't fancy his chances. Of course, yeah, because someone else could have a better Exactly. Pair. And here he is, he's actually in a late position, so, oh my God, we're already talking about position, and, well, you know, he's raised it up, maybe he can scare these guys off, but I reckon Craven will come in, and in fact, Zalim will probably come in, and now the sack will probably go away. So it's, it is just about appreciating your hands, and that's the easiest thing to start with, is just be really, really kind of harsh on yourself. Yeah. And play junk. Feel free to play junk, because once you've been stung, enough by chasing straights that never happen, flushes that never appear. Because it is, you know, you, you will find that this is the irony is whenever you're holding on to clubs, no clubs will come down. Yeah. When you're holding on to hearts, they won't come down. But you've got to have experienced that a million times before you start realizing that if you don't like the cards you've been dealt, the fact that they're suited shouldn't really make too much difference to you. Because it isn't going to make too much difference to the maths. Yeah. So it shouldn't make too much difference to you. So that, I would say, is the perfect place to start, is just be really ultra aware when you throw cards away do watch the f you know do watch the board and see what develops so that you can say oh if only i'd kept hold of yeah because mostly when you say that to yourself you don't say that to yourself as often as you end up going phew i'm glad i got rid, glad of, I got rid of, yeah. of that because it would have hurt me i would have run into this guy with aces this guy with queens this guy with yada 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 and i think as well yeah you also have to look at it and think even if you do see that if you had kept hold of that you know those cards you, you might have hit your trips or you might have hit um your flush is to think chances are in most cases i wouldn't so you've got to be you can't think oh no you know yeah and the problem you find is a bit like you know it's a bit like the bad but you know everyone has lots of bad beats to tell everyone always remembers all the horrible things that happen to them but people generally seem to remember the worst stuff yeah far more than they remember the good stuff and you can get quite deep on this but there's this whole theory about you know how the feelings of joy have to be about two and a half times as strong as the feelings of loss for you to remember them more than the bad times. Okay. Because if you ask any player, you know, tell me the last three great hands you had that you really felt good about, they began. going, <laughs> ask them about the last 17 bad beats. Bang, this one, and then Don't I had aces, them, exactly. and then I had 10. Exactly. And that's the thing is that people generally go, I threw away a pair of sevens and a seven came down. But how many times has it been the other way around where you mm. pay to continue? And it didn't come yeah. down. And, and that's the thing is you've got to be really brutally honest with yourself. Because uh, otherwise it's so easy to convince yourself that, oh, I, I, I've got to keep playing these rags. Well, I play these rags because so many times I throw them away and I hit them on the flop. But generally that isn't the case. Yeah. And we know that to be true because we know the maths actually equals that out. Yeah. But again, you've got to experience it. Otherwise you just keep kidding yourself and then thinking, why am I spending so much money? You can't beat yourself up over the times that you do put them down and it does land on the flop because Absolutely. most times that's not going to happen. Absolutely. And we, I mean, again, we know, you know, if you've got a pocket pair, you've got every seven and a half times you can hit yourself the set and you make your three of a kind. But that doesn't mean every time you throw it away and it happens, you go, oh, I knew I should hold on to that. Because also, if you're throwing away small pairs, even if you do make your set, doesn't mean you're not going to get cracked by a bigger set because other people will be doing the same thing. But again, you've just got to experience it, realize that that's the way poker works. 
And it's not like you want to just be like a rock and just yeah. wait for your aces and your ace king, but playing all these kind of suited connectors, you know, five sixes and four sevens, it's like you just got to realize that there are times to play rags and there are mostly times to just mm. throw it away. And if you hit something, I've thrown away four sevens so many times and the prop will go four, four, seven. You go, oh my God, but actually that's such a rare thing yeah. to happen. And if it would have cost me money to actually get to see that, it's just not worth doing. And you realize if you want to be a successful poker player and make profit, you just got to let these kind of junky hands go away. And if you hit something, so be it. Most of the time, it's always going to be the right decision to make. But the more hands you play, then the more you're going to get used to it and the more you're going to learn. So we're going to have a look at some more hands and we're going to go back to the multi table tournament. We. Oui. See how they're look. getting on there. Let's, Let's have a look. go through the green window. I know it's blue, but it kind of turns into green. <laughs> They're all green now. I think we should have more colours. You know, I think a red table's long overdue. But here we see. Blinds 25.50 now. Yeah, we've stepped up in the blinds. And JJ, who we identified down in seat number four a bit earlier on, he was down to 660. He has obviously done all right for himself because uh, now we see Mr. Blond is down and Willie Sonny has actually just gone all in. Ace 10 plays against 10 queen. Two pairs beats two pairs. So. You know, it's good to see these guys actually getting a bit busy. And the truth is, again, at this stage, when the blinds are so small, this is probably a time when most people you're playing against are being like super solid and just waiting for their big hands. Yeah. Where if you do get involved, a bit more speculative, the blinds aren't going to kill you. You could sort of dedicate a certain amount of your chip stack to just having a look. Right. Your lane position, you know, like here we see, like in seat number one, queen nine is in the cutoff position. Actually, Mr. Blonde has now made it too, too expensive, so this is a bad example. But had that just been sort of called, if everyone was just flat calling round to you, even though Queen Nine isn't really a brilliant hand. If everyone had just bet the 50. If everyone yeah. had just sort of limped round, which again, you can get in the early stages of a tournament, everyone being very passive, is that even though Queen Nine is never going to be a hand we particularly advocate, is that if it's cheap to get into in the late position, the difference you've got is that if you do hit a good hand, you know, if you are lucky enough to bang yourself into a flush or you run into like a couple of pairs or yeah. a three of a kind of something, the good news is there's lots of people involved in the hand, so it's almost worth taking a, a chance because you could potentially get paid off by lots of players. Yeah, because there's, there's quite a few people in the pot, but you can get in quite cheaply. Exactly. And if you hit it, it's going to be a big pot. And so the truth is, you've just, and it can be a dangerous technique, but as long as you appreciate what you're doing, I am just going to donate some money mm -hmm. to have a speculative prod here. If I hit something good, then brilliant. If I don't, then you've got to be ready to let it go. That's the key, though. You have to be yeah. prepared to put uh, it down. And, and it's almost like the worst thing is that if you hit a small piece of it, if you then get too attached to it. Mm. And that's why you can only use that strategy if it's cost you hardly anything to get into. Because right here, if everyone's sitting with over a grand, everyone here is kind of around the 1500 mark, to spend 50 bucks, as, even though it's not you know, cash, but you know, to, to spend 50 of your chips to see a flop, you hit the flop really nicely. I mean, here, look, his trade is, is he it's actually raised it up just to 100, got a couple of callers, bang. Um, as it stands, no one else has really hit enough, but he's made small bets. But again, if anyone had bet back, back him or if there'd been none of the connection on the flop, yeah. then obviously he lets it go. He had a go, he didn't make a set. But that's the whole point, is that it's a lot less dangerous to do that at this early stage when the blinds are reasonably low than you know, a bit later on in the tournament where the blinds might be a fairly large percentage of your stack. So, you know, it, it is, it's, it, as you say, there's a lot to take into consideration, but you've just got to be aware of everything. Yeah. And so many people don't even know where they are, you know, they, they'll call, a, they'll call a, a raise before the flop, and all of a sudden they're the first to act, and they just hadn't really looked at where the dealer button was and didn't realise that they were going to be first to act. So you just need to take your time and, and try and be aware of as many different bits as you can. But it's good to see the guys getting busy here in the uh, multi-table tournament. We've got a, a long night ahead of us. We're going to be coming in and out of this table. So it'd be good to see if we see any of, these, any of these names survive until a bit later on. Definitely. And then we'll see some seriously big stacks as well, shouldn't we, later on? Yeah, this 2550 blinds is not going to be something <laughs> we see again a bit later on. It's going to get pretty hairy. Yeah, definitely. OK, let's go and take a look at our cash game. Snap it stepped himself up in the, the money. He was just over, I think, 60 when we came yeah. in. And that's the thing with these, you know, 25 cents, 50 cents, as you, as you rightly said, it's not massive, but it doesn't take too long for the pots to get fairly kind of juicy. Yeah. So that's the thing with, uh, with the cash game, completely different to the tournament. The blinds are 25 and 50 cents, but they don't move like they do in the multi-table tournament no, or the tournaments. And that's why it's a grind, because you can just sit there for hours and hours and hours on end, and some of these guys that are professional poker players that just sit online for 
five or six hours, just sit down, get the, get the kettle on. Yeah. And they're just there and they're just going to wait it out because there's no pressure. That's the whole thing with the, the tournaments is that you want to get, because it's a knockout competition, you've got to get to a winner. The cash tables, they're these perpetual games. People are coming, people are yeah. going, people are taking breaks. Um, people are multi-tabling, so you know we, we find it quite often when we bounce over to some of the single table tournaments. Some of these names will be there as well because they're just mixing up and trying to avoid going kind of too crazy. But the, if you did that in the multi in the multi-table tournament or a sit and go, and you just sat back, the blinds eventually would would just eat up your stack. Yeah, and with the single table tournaments, most of the ones we watch here, it's for every uh, ten hands the blinds jump up. So. You, well, you can work out the maths, but it doesn't take too long before if you just sit back and wait for a hand. The other problem with waiting for a hand is that you make a hand, doesn't necessarily guarantee anybody else is going to play against you. Yeah. And it's, uh, it is the way of the world that you wait and you finally go, wow, a pair of kings or a pair of aces. Everyone and you try and slow play or you try and you know, make a value bet. And it goes fold, 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 fold. And you pick up 75 cents in blinds and you're like, yeehaw. And you've, that was, you've waited I'll, an hour yeah, for that. Absolutely. And that's the whole point is that's the difference between the good players and the bad players is most people can make money out of having the best hand yes. because, well, that's the way it is. But, you know, that isn't enough in poker and that's why it's such an exciting game with all the bluffing and the, you know, kind of the, the representing hands is that you, you've got to be able to do more than just play aces well because who can't play aces well? Mm. There's our leaderboard we see. J-Boss J House down the bottom is uh, still nibbling around the under 10 area. But yeah, a little nine. But again, with the 25 cents, 50 cents blinds, that's still going to get a good few orbits at the table. That's the way it is with cash, cash games. The money goes up and the money goes down. He's picked himself up a, uh, a straight draw here. But he doesn't hit it. And nobody else has hit the, the board and they're all getting a bit cagey here. Yeah, he needs the three there. That's, that's one of the things I found as well when you first start playing was where I was told to make sure to always look for the for the because it's the best five card hand and not just get always look to see what the best five card hand could be yeah and, and try just try and work it out even when you're not playing just to watch other people and keep doing that in your head over and over so absolutely. you learn absolutely i mean and it's easily done you know and and you know the mechanics of texas everyone gets two cars and those are yours and yours alone but of course by the end of the game if you get to the river which is the fifth card on the board of course you've now got seven cars to pick the best five card hand from, and a lot of people kind of always get a bit confused by that sometimes. Um, but, and also it's very easy to miss stuff. You think, yeah. I mean the number of times, I was actually out, I was out in uh, France a couple of weeks ago for a big tournament, and there was a guy who literally threw his cards down, stood up, put his jack on, it was already to leave and he hadn't even seen, and these are quite professional players, he hadn't even seen that he'd made a straight, because he got so focused on waiting to hit his ace yeah. against the guy's queens or something. Yeah that he hadn't even noticed the board had actually come down with like a two, three, yeah. four, five. So you do, it, it takes a bit of concentration and, and quite often if we have little home games and you're teaching friends, they'll be like, like stop, stop, like why, why have I won? Yeah, that's, that's one of the things I think you have to look, why, I sometimes stop and go and look through the thing, why did he win that? Because you're so yeah. wrapped up in looking at the pair or, or, or your pair, you forget that, you know, he's made a straight or he's made two pair and, and has a better kicker than you. Yeah, absolutely. And you just, you know, again, I mean, it's, it's the easiest thing I always just pick, right, okay, you pick out the best five cards. Go, oh, yeah, the best five cards, right, yeah. Or, you know, especially when you get a split pot. Yeah. You know, if you've both got ace, you know, you've both got aces with a weak kicker, you know, a really weak sort of second hand, twos and threes. If the board comes down with a couple of aces and a queen and a king, you know, it's a split pot. Why, wait, 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 but I've got, I've got three and you've only got two. And it's like, Again, pick out the best five cards, and you realise that that card doesn't actually come into the equation. Yeah. So it does, but it's, it's like any game. You, you know, learn any game. It takes a little while to, to be able to pick up the, the important elements and, and see what's there to be seen. But it, yeah, it takes, it takes a long while to sort of, it becomes second nature. And that's the point, is when identifying the hands is no longer something you have to think too much about, then you might want to start concentrating on position. Yeah. And then when you're no longer going, oh my God, oh, what am I on the button? Oh, I didn't realise it. You know, that's when you can start thinking about all the positional bets and what the bets might mean. And there is a lot to it, but you Just can't one step at a time. Absolutely. And it's not like it's a game that you can't have fun with unless you're super aware of everything going on. Um, that's the thing with the internet, I think, because you can play so cheaply online and indeed for free if you want. It doesn't have to cost a lot, so you can do it for fun until you feel comfortable with the hands and absolutely. working out. 
all, all the basics. It doesn't have to cost very much. It doesn't have to cost anything. Absolutely. And look, I just here Jay. Jay's just hit himself on the flop of full house. So he's got three of a kind twos with a pair of kings. Oh. And that has just improved. <laughs> Better full house. To kings full of uh, twos. And, and this could be dangerous for Snap It. Um, it really depends. Snap It, we know, is a pretty solid player. So Snap It's got two pairs, the kings and the jacks. But exactly. uh, Jade's got three kings and two twos now. That's the best five card hand. Absolutely, absolutely. The other two doesn't come into it now. And, and I mean, this is great. So, see, the, the sad thing here is, is that, that Jay is down the bottom. He's run out of money. And this would be a brilliant opportunity for him to have cleaned up because he probably would have got more money out of Snap It. He would have got more out of Jazz. Yeah. But of course, he, he doesn't have, have enough, enough in his to bet. Stack. Yeah. And it's a bit like the argument that says, you know, with the, with the, uh, the tables here, you can opt to sit down with 10 times the, uh, the big blind or 100 times the big blind. And we always advocate that, again, assuming you're playing in, in a range that you can afford to, you should always sit down with the maximum because in that instance, I don't know if, if Jay sat down with less or more or whether he's just lost himself into that yeah. position. But when you do get a big hand, if you've not sat down with the maximum chips in front of you, then you can't really maximise that. Yeah. And it's like he probably could have got it. two people there, would have probably paid him off another round Big of betting. Style, yeah. And that's turned out, you know, he ran out of chips and he's back up to 33. So if you can't sit down with the maximum, you should, probably should be playing at a lower, lower stakes, is that right? Well, yeah, I mean, I would say so. That, and, you know, there's plenty of, plenty of tables out there that, that will play 10 cents, 20 cents games. Um, the only kind of, not necessarily the danger, but the only downside of that is that when you play on play tables, you do find a lot of people that just don't care yeah. about how they play because they know it's not cost them anything. And I found this when I, I mean this was a long while ago, but when I was first playing and I did learn mostly online, just sitting on the play tables. And mostly you'd be very lucky and you find a bunch of guys and they're all doing the same thing. They're practicing their game, they're trying to be very disciplined and thinking I'm playing this as if it cost, you know, cost me a billion yeah. pounds to sit down here. But you'll always get somebody that just goes, cool, raise, cool, raise, cool, raise. Because he just thinks it's funny or it's boring or you know, yeah. whatever. Um, and the only problem you have is when you go to those really low limit games like the 10 cents, 20 cents. If, and I, I kind of actually, I, I sort of put my hands in the air and, and say I'm guilty of this. Quite often if I'm working and I want to play a game, I don't necessarily want to like invest a huge amount of money because I'm not really investing a huge amount of attention. Yes. But just because I'm an addict, I might have some <laughs> little game going on. But I know that I will probably be far more loose the cheaper the, the limit yeah, is, of course, because yeah. it's like, well, I'm chasing a gut shot, there's only four cars in the deck that can help me, but at worst I'm going to lose, you know, 66 cents. Yes. So it, you do need to find a level where you're not putting yourself under any sort of undue financial pressure, but you're getting a good game. And, and here we see the 25.50, these guys, you know, they're not, they're they're not risking it seriously. Their, yeah, they're not risking their house here, but there's enough money here to be, uh, to be played with. And they're going to play a good game. Exactly, and we see it every single night. We see some really quality play on these tables. It's not like any of these guys are, uh, you know, lesser players than the guys sitting on the twenty-five dollar, fifty dollar table. Yeah. And in fact, quite often we see these names multi-tabling, and they're playing a small game and they're playing a big game. And it's mostly the self-discipline of not getting bored. Yeah. Is because if you get bored, you're probably going to get involved in hands you shouldn't do. So you'll find a lot of players, there's one prime game which is centre of their screen and this is the one where they've spent some serious money to get involved in. But they have a couple of other games going on because that way they know it keeps their brains occupied, they don't start sort of getting involved in silly hands. Um, and but also, that takes practice as well, I suppose, because you've got more you know, players to take note of, more hands yeah. and chip stacks to take note of. Absolutely. And, I mean, and again, that's down to personal preference. I, I interviewed a whole bunch of different online players recently, and there was one guy, one guy I went past, and he had ten tables on the go. See, and, I, I can't do it, really. And, 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 and to be honest, that's the only time, that's the one and only time I've ever seen anybody with that, that many. many tables. It's generally, would you say, about four, maybe, is that yeah, the average? Yeah, it Because you can like, keep track of four. Absolutely, yeah. Most of the guys, and some big names, some big kind of British players, and when they sit down, they play three or four tables. Because, again, that's where they find they can focus on all the tables, but it's not so quiet that they're just like... And then I spoke to Greg Raymer, who was the, the World Series po the poker champion in 2004. He just plays one game, but that's because he tends to do lots of other things. He plays one game, but he does his emails, and he does a bit of this, and yeah. does a bit of that. So that's clearly, that's the way his it's brain works. It's personal preference again, like, isn't it? It's all... But, you know, it is important to make sure you find a level where you're not, you know, you're not committing too much money, you're not committing too much concentration, you're not just staring at one screen going insane. Yeah. 
because that will be the time when you get no hands for an hour and then you get aces and everyone folds. And, you, you know, it is ultimately also a fun game. It's not just, you know, about making money or proving how amazing you are at poker. It, it, you know, it should be fun to play. That is a great thing about playing online. You can actually tailor make it to suit you. You can play as many as you want. You can play the type of game you want. You can play yeah. for the, whichever stakes you want. Absolutely. And there's so, so many. And you can tailor make it. And you kids don't know you're bored. <laughs> but that's the truth. Wasn't thing. that in his day, you know? Oh, no, I mean, I'm not that <laughs> older. But I know some older people. that. Were. But, you know, it really was only a matter of years ago where that's why you've, you find so many of the, uh, the big players like... Negranu or Helmuth or whatever, and these guys also very good at Omaha or mm. Seven Card Stud. Because in the old days, if you turned up at a casino Way or a card then. room, um, you know you didn't have a, a lobby. There weren't 600 games going on. You could pick what limit you want, what yeah. game you want. If the only game going was a Seven Card Stud game, well then that's what you were going to play. If the only game going was Omaha, if there were no tournaments, because that's the other thing. You imagine travelling. Imagine. I know that you don't leave your bedrooms often, but imagine driving to a casino and putting your money down and going out on the first hand. You can't just click on the next game in the lobby, you, you get your coat and you go home yeah. again. So there is a completely different world out there now, and, and, and it's brilliant because it does allow you to play as many different games as you want, different games at the same time. I mean, actually, I wouldn't, I've done this a few times, I wouldn't suggest you have a game of Omaha going up here and a game of Texas because it just scrambles your brain. But if that's what you want to do, then that's the beauty of the internet. We have colour TVs now as well, not just black and white. And I understand that some of these have sound as well. Yeah. And moving pictures. <laughs> it's witchcraft, I tell you. All right, back to the game. I'm not that old. Seriously. I'm only messing. These, light, these lights are very harsh. I'm only messing. So whatever stage of the game you're at, whether you're a brand new player or you've been playing a long time, then uh, we do want to hear from you. You can ask anything at all. It would be about cash games, tourneys, multi-table tournaments. Please do get in touch with us. We'd love to hear from you. There's the text number 62211. Or you can email as well. And just by magic, there it is on your screen, poker at pokernightlive.co.uk. Good stuff. We also, for a bit of fun as well, we talked about this before. Which celebrity, we want, we want your texts and emails on this. We'll have a bit of a laugh with this throughout the night. Which celebrity, not poker related now, no. which celebrity or character do you think would make a great poker player? And, and, and why? Yes, more importantly, why? We're looking for how creative you can be with this. Because I was saying to Matt before that I think Carol Vorderman should play poker. Because she's got such a great mathematical brain. She'd be able to work everything out perfectly. And the dads love her. Yeah, you know, oh, anybody, they do. anybody over about 35, 40, they'd be totally distracted if they she wears her, one of her dresses. Yeah. So I was thinking more of the Darth Vader sort of Chewbacca side <laughs> of things, as in a, you know, that, they'd be quite good because, uh, well, obviously they could just beat you up. <laughs> you know, you know, if you kind of felt that, that full script around your throat if you went down with aces against Darth Vader. Uh, or Darren Brown, there's another one we said, because if you beat him, he could just like look into your eyes, your eyes around your eyes, hypnotise you, go back, take mm. the chips back and play the hand again, only he'd fold that time. So we want to hear who do you think a non-poker playing person, could be fictional, could be a celebrity, who would make a good poker player and why? So Yuri Geller would be quite good because he could like use his powers and bend the other players' cards back so you could see what they've got in their <laughs> pocket cards, couldn't he? Now Instead of spoons, nice. he could like bend whole, whole cards. <laughs> well, they are. Well, talking of magic, <laughs> look at our leaderboard. Good old J-Boss. There he was. He was scrabbling around the bottom. He had six and then he had nine. And now he's gone boom. He's jumped over. That's some serious play for a 25 cents, 50 uh, cents game. Yeah. That's what we were saying. You know, even these levels, don't be, uh, don't be misled into thinking these are Mickey Mouse levels because you think that's 25 cents. What's that? What's that to us? That's like 10 pence or so something. So he's made, what, like $116 yeah, since in the, we yeah, started? In, the, in like the last 30 minutes or something, I think, that we kind of bounced into this game. So, you know, that's good. And, and I, I'm sure, you know, now he wishes, he'd love to flop a full house like he did before because he could, you know, make some dosh out of this. Yeah, if he, if he had the, the kings and uh, full of twos now, he'd be able to seriously bet into that Absolutely, I think it's a pair of eights and a pair of jacks. So, but, you know, it changes. It'd be interesting to see if it changes the way he plays or whether he just has a style and when he does well, he does well. When he doesn't, he doesn't. But that, that's, that's pretty impressive to have jumped up that much in such a low-level, you know, limit game. Because it could be quite easy to get really disheartened when you, when you get you know, that low down and, and, and just yeah. start playing foolishly. But he's obviously not gone on tilt. 
pulled himself up and, and... No, and that's the truth. I think that's the thing is, it's what I'm finding more and more, even though, I mean, it's funny for me, even though I've been playing for a very long time, it's only recently that it's kind of, poker's become my sort of soul, what I do. Yeah. And so I've started interviewing and speaking with people that have been playing it, you know, every single day. And the truth is, they, that's how they say the only way to be successful is that you have to just accept that's the way it is. And it's like these guys that, you know, me joking aside, you know, travelling to France to enter a tournament and get knocked out on their second hand. And they don't all go screaming and crying and banging their fists. They just go, oh, well, because they know that that's the way it's going to be most of the time. Most of the time in tournaments, you're not going to win mm. because the odds are against you. But because the payoff is such a big when you incentive, do win, yeah. exactly. So they know that the difference is in a, you know in a single hand of, of poker. You know what are you going to lose? What are you going to win? In a tournament, it's like we see with, even tonight with our multi-table game, ten dollar buy-in, three hundred forty-two people. You know the odds are against you, but the payoff is massive. You've got a chance, and if you win that for ten dollars, nine hundred forty dollars. And, and that's the thing is that then you think, well, nine hundred forty dollars, that's just bought you a whole bunch of multi-table. Mm. buy-ins and that's the way you have to see it is that you have to accumulate and accumulate so it's, it's kind of a bit of a bit of a swizz but imagine this was your first ever game and this is the only money you've ever spent is ten dollars if you make 940 in your first game Flash your months. That, that's going to give you a lot of in inverted commas free entry yes and if you win again and it's again profit. Exactly. It's, yeah. so so that's the truth of it is that you've just got to be prepared and there's jay you know he was all the way down to nothing and we don't know what he bought in with because it was before we actually came and watched him but Stick around, you know that your, your poker's good. Let's see if he manages uh, to improve on it even more or uh, whether yeah. it dwindles away as quickly as it came. Exactly, and that's the thing with any statistics. It, you know, a lot of people, we get a lot of emails, people saying, oh, I'm winning two out of every ten tournaments. That you have to play a lot of poker before any statistics you gather are really worth anything. Because mm. if, we you know, if we were looking about the last half an hour, he's gone from nine to 122. We don't know. He might have started with the hundreds and gone all the way down and reloaded, or you know, it, it's it's very hard. You have to, sort to watch over over a long period Absolutely. of time. Absolutely, he could have been here since last Wednesday. Of course. Well, he could in a cash game. He could have been. Could have been. Just you, you know. can sit down as long as you want in a cash game, yeah. can't you? And leave when you want. Grabbed a couple of couple of seconds sleep, power napping between hands. Well, this is nice. Snap it is not somebody who's going to have too much trouble uh, knowing how to play kings. And the good news for him is that though most of the players around the table don't have much of a starting hand, Zalem has got pocket tens, and I'm sure we'll call this if only to see if he gets lucky. And when I say lucky, what I really mean is, is that if he's seeing a, a raise from Snap it, he's got to put Snap it on the hand. It raises him back, and they're going to be heads up here. And Zalem really needs to hit a ten. He's got five cards to come. Snap it. I mean, that's a big signal. Wowee. And Zalem really... Very lucky there. He is, because, you know, you mentioned on it earlier on about how, you know, betting is a big part of also the other skills. And betting mostly you use not just to make money in the pot, but to, like, ask questions. Yeah. And, you know, so Snap It raises it, Zalem re-raises, and Snap It re-raises again. And you've got to be thinking, well, hang on a minute, you know, somebody that, that raises... If I re-raise, well, he's not mucking around because not only has he gone to call it, he's actually raised it mm. again. So you've got to know that Snap it is somebody who's now got a hand. A great hand. And, and in fact, I'm surprised that Zalim made that second call. Yeah. Because it's like, I've tried to get a bit kind of creative with my tens. This guy has got a hand. You, you've got, you know, you're constantly, mm. when you're looking at people's betting, you're trying to put them on a range of hands. And Snap it is not going to make a raise and a re-raise with 9-10 off suit. He's clearly got a pair of something, or he's got what we would call one of the big premium hands, an ace-king or an ace-queen. Yeah. So calling with the tens then, if he sees a jack, or a queen, a king or an ace come down on any other board, he can no longer fancy himself as winning. And then he's put loads into the pot and it's Absolutely, too late. but there it is, and it, you know, consider it whether he got lucky or not, or whether it just, that's how he saw the hand playing out, but he gets a 10 on the flop and makes his set, and then he takes a lot of money mm. for it, but that was actually being a little bit disrespectful as to what Snappit was doing with his chips, because there's no way you can imagine Snappit's bluffing or mucking around. Because it's very rare, isn't it, if, if someone re-raises you before the flop, that they're bluffing. Absolutely, For them to yeah. do that, you've got to yeah. ask yourself, what have they got, why have they re-raised me, and People are always oh, bluffing, he's bluffing. It's very rare yeah. that they actually would be, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely, and that's what we always say about watching the tables here, because you get to see a lot of hands played out here, and up here in the Poker Night Live blimp, high above the normal people, you know, we get to see every single hand, and you'll see yeah. that, that 
<laughs> very little bluffing goes mm. on. Quite often, a little bit of bluffing. So if there's a hand where it's been checked all the way around the table to one player who then makes a move, it's not necessarily a bluff. It's kind of like a kind of a procedural bet. Yeah, yeah. But you'll see that most often when people bet, they've got something, and when people check, they don't. And that's really the truth of it, is there's not as much bluffing goes on, especially at these levels and at these stages in tournaments. But um, it's good to watch, but it is, you know, you've got to watch the betting and try and think, Wonder what why? Hands, yeah, yeah, why what, what hand that? does he have before the flop that makes him want to put nearly all of his chips in? And you've got to decide whether you respect that mm -hmm. bet or whether you think he's, ah, oh, whatever, I'll call him. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to have another look at the motor table, Tony? Yes, morning? let's see how we're getting on with the green table, shall we? There it is. So we've. Uh, Espe is that sort of especially um, before the flop as well? Because if, you know, at least when you've got cards there, you can represent stuff once the flops come down. You can represent certain hands, so you're more likely to bluff. But before the flop, if you're going to re raise, chances are you've got. Like you said, one of the premium hands. Yeah, and the thing is, uh, we mentioned this the other night, and, and this this might be something that that's not really for for a for a kind of a, you know, amateur night. But there's very little lying goes on before the flop. Yeah, is that people are pretty honest. Where a lot of players have weak playing after the flop. Most people know that if you've got a pair of jacks before the flop, you do this. If you've got ace king, you do this. If you've got four nine offsuit, you throw. Most people, there's no real confusion about what to do before the flop. What a lot of people are not very good at is how to play after the flop. Yeah. You know, and, and the number of times people go an ace king and they raise up because they know that's what they're meant to do, and the flop comes down four seven jack, and the action's on them, and they just go, oh, oh yeah. I'll check then. And you think, well, you raised before the flop, and now you're checking. You're waving a flag in the air that tells me I've not made anything. So if I'm a decent player, I'm going to see that you raised and then that you've checked. So I'm going to bet at you, even yeah. if I have nothing. So you've got to be aware of, of the people you're playing against and what level they are. But you know, you've, you've just, it, it's, it's really easy to know what to do before the flop. But after the flop, that's where it gets tricky. How do you play if you've hit? And then what do you do more importantly if you don't? Because most of the time you won't. All the hands you see people play tonight, they've chosen to play king eight, four three, jack five. Yeah. Most of the time they ain't gonna hit anything. But the guys that know how to bet will still make money regardless of whether they've hit their hands or not. So we started with three hundred and forty two, we're down to one hundred and fifty nine. Wow we um twenty tables left. And uh Pasty Bap is chip leader. Pasty Bap. Pasty Bap, yeah. <laughs> Pasty Bap, a regular on our forums as well, with a tremendously uh, entertaining little avatar that he uses <laughs> on the forums. Uh, not now, folks. Wait until we're off air, but do go and visit our forums. Lots of good, uh, good juicy conversation to be had there. Yeah, it certainly is. And look for Pasty Bap. You'll enjoy his little picture, I'm sure. <laughs> Here we are at 75, uh, 150 as well. You can see the blinds have taken a jump. It's going to start putting uh, start putting pressure on people. But some decent hands here. Ace, Jack. It's not necessarily so strong because it's in an early position there. So Ace, Jack has called, but now he's first to act. And it's like, like we say, that's when you start going, well, Ace, Jack, yep, is certainly not the worst starting hand, but in first position. And that's where that whole understanding of the strength of a hand. A hand in first position has to be a bit stronger than... Because you're first to act, so Absolutely. you've got less information. Exactly, so the pressure's on you, but also you know nothing about your opponents. If you're last to act and it's been checked all the way around, you might think, well, no one's hit it. Yeah. If you're last to act and somebody's made a big bet, well, you know he's probably made something and it's your decision. When you're first to act, it's the weakest place in the world because you just know nothing about your opponents. And the worst thing is you make a bet Anything and somebody raises it <laughs> and you're like, oh, God. So it's... Um, <laughs> Got to think about your position. It's as important as the cards. It is. We'll maybe talk about um, position a bit later on, the yeah. importance of it, go into that in a bit more depth. But I would just want to get a couple of emails before the break, Matt. Certainly, certainly. Uh, this is from David Holden, who says, Hi, guys. I love the show. I have a friend who I introduced to poker a few years ago. He won his first casino tournament a few weeks ago, although he made a deal with his opponent when it got to heads up to split the prize money between them. Personally, I wouldn't do deals with anyone to split the money, as I'm a very competitive person. And if I did, I wouldn't feel like I'd won the tournament. How do you guys feel about players doing deals to get an even share in the prize money? Yeah, well this is very much down to your preference. Um, 
I mean, the, the, the truth of it is, it's entirely down to the, the players, unless a cadre has stipulated that we don't let people do deals. But, you know, we get down to heads up, and one of us is going to win, you know, 500 quid, and one of us is going to win 800 quid. Well, it's a case of if we want to say to you, what, should we just split it between us? Yeah, then, but the truth is, it depends. If you've got somebody who's really low on chips, obviously they're going to be quite keen to make a deal, whereas a guy who's got a load of chips is going to be going, well, hang on. But you don't know, quite often these tournaments can go on for a long while and people are tired mm -hmm. and they're thinking, do you know what, do you really want to like, slog this out for another six hours? Or should we just say, well done mate, shake hands? It's entirely down to you, but the truth is if you're ever in that situation, which is a great situation to be in because you've made the money. I, I played in a tournament recently, there was only a sit and go tournament in Vegas. And when it got down to the three players who'd made the money, they all wanted to start cutting deals. And I was like, no, I don't want to cut a deal, I don't mind cutting a deal maybe heads up, but mostly as uh, David says there, you want to feel like you've won, you want to take first prize, so it's entirely your choice. People will always try and chop up deals, but never feel you're under any pressure to actually go ahead with them. I wouldn't. I'm an all or nothing sort of a girl. I'd be like that. No way. That's what I've heard. <laughs> all or nothing. Uh, I've got an email from Stamper, who's in LA, and he says, oh. Great show as always. I've recently started playing multi-table action. In fact, I can cram nine tables on my 21-inch in monitor, which makes for fast-moving action, racking up hundreds of hands an hour. It means I have to play on intuition and I can't spend too much time thinking about any one hand. I usually play low limit cash games and I see a steady, consistent rise in my bankroll. Isn't positive expectation great? Hey, do you have any suggestions for multi-tabling? Are you uh, for it or against it? And what's the most tables you've uh, seen being played at the same time? You said well, 10. Yeah, we just mentioned this. Um, multi-tabling is a great thing to do if you don't trust yourself like to not get involved in crazy hands. You know, multi-tabling is good if you know that you'd like to get lots of action going because with multi-tables you will. Um, the downside is you can't focus, you can't concentrate, you might not get any tells off the players. Uh, the most I've ever seen is 10, and that was once in my life fairly recently. But generally you find people will play three or four tables at any time. Uh, but as we mentioned before, it's really down to you to find your happy medium where you know you can still focus and concentrate. But you're not getting bored and going off and doing something else and missing important information you could get off the players that you're with. And um, we want to know which celebrity, non-poker related, mm -hmm. do you think would make a great poker player? So text them into us, 62211, or email poker at pokernightlive.co.uk. We'll have a bit of fun with that before the end of the night. Personally, I think Pamela Anderson, because she'd keep her cards close to her chest. Ba boom <laughs> See what I did there? <laughs> Very nice. Very well, nice. we'll get some of your emails in a few moments. We're going to take a short break now, but stick around and we'll get back to the multi table tournament when we get back. Welcome back to Poker Night Live. It's Lindsay and Matt with you till two o'clock, watching great games. We've uh, had a really good multi-table tourney. Yeah, yeah. We've had some exciting stuff on our twenty-five cent, fifty cents table. Some action from some of the boys. Yeah, someone going from six dollars to about one hundred and twenty in the space of a few hands. It can be done. So we're going to get back to a table very soon, but we do want you to get in touch with us here at Poker Night Live. It's your show and it's amateur night tonight, so we want your questions. You can text them through to us. There's the number 62211, or you can email poker at pokernightlive.co.uk. Yeah, good stuff. So get those questions coming through to us. Had some good ones so far. And also, a bit of a silly theme running throughout the night, because we are silly, aren't we? Well, it's Saturday night. You're going to have a bit of craziness. <laughs> a, a, a bit of wacky fun. <laughs> we want to know which celebrity or... Well, no, it doesn't have to be a celebrity. Be a what non-poker playing... Person. It might be a character, a film, or a cartoon character, mm -hmm. or a celebrity, or a f dead film star. But we're looking for somebody. Who do you think would make a good poker player, and why yeah. specifically? Because I said Carol Vorderman. Yeah. She's so good at maths. And, and I said Darren Brown because of that. So we want your ideas to have a bit of a laugh, and also your poker questions. So please do six double two double one or email poker at pokernightlive. Dot co uk. Right, I'm going to get a couple of emails before we get to our multi-table tourney. This is from Muswell Hill, uh, from Otis, and he says, I love the show, guys. Last week I was playing with ten of my mates for a prize pool of around £100. I made it heads up, and the chip stacks at this stage for both of us were quite even. On one of the hands I got, I flopped a straight flush draw, and my opponent raised the big blind. I then re-raised, and my mate went all in. After a long think, hmm, 
I called and didn't make anything and my friend took the money with trips. Was this the right move on my behalf or was it way too risky? What would you have done? Well, <laughs> I think you probably know the answer. I to think that, he to does as well. Because the truth is you say you both start off with equal stack, so you're you're not in a position where you're you've got to make any crazy moves. The key thing is let me ask you, okay, pick envelope one or envelope two. Envelope one is a draw. So it's a drawing hand, it's nothing. It's full of potential, but it's actually nothing. Or do you want a made hand? Because your friend's got a pocket pair. Now, do you want to risk your life, all of the chips, on something that's packed with potential or something that's actually a made hand? Um, and also, it's kind of almost like, unless you know your mate to be a bluffer and he's been bullying you around all night, he's made a raise, you've made a re-raise. For him to come back over the top of it, it's exactly like one of the hands we saw a bit earlier on, where they were betting and raising and re-raising. You've got to put him on a hand. And though you do have a smashing draw, it is but a draw. And I think the truth is, once you've been knocked out of enough tournaments on draws, against even a pocket even a pocket pair of twos is beating you at that point so the truth is the question to ask yourself whenever you're about to make a big move like that slow down and just ask yourself do I need to get involved am I assured of winning because certainly yep the options are you could make your draw you knock him out and you're carried shoulder high as a hero but more likely you're actually not going to see the cards you need and all of a sudden you've lost the tournament if you just made a small draw uh, sorry a small raise and you've gone to the flop, then you know a bit more information. But as all of this action is pre-flop, then it's a case of, I know you've got a nice looking hand and the flop has given you some options, but are you really going to put all your chips in? You've got two more cards to come, are you really going to risk your entire life? So I would say, no, give it up. You've got equal amounts of chips at this stage. You've not lost a lot. Let it go and wait for a hand where it's the other way around, where here's the one that goes into this situation as an underdog. Okay, but thanks for your email, Osis. Good stuff. I'm going to get this one in um, off Jer because it's about multi-table tournaments. We're okay. going to get back to ours really soon. And he says, I play both single table and multi-table tournaments. I usually come in the top two on the single table tournaments, but rarely get in the money on the multi-tables. I play both games the same, playing very tight and only playing hands like queens, kings, aces, ace, queen, ace, um, king, until it gets to about five people left. And then I start to loosen up a bit. Do you think these are good tactics? or am I doing something wrong in the multi-table tournaments? And he says, any help? He'd love it. Okay. Um, the truth is you can't really play the same way in a multi-table tournament as a single table. Um, I would suggest that probably the reason you're successful in a single table is because you will find with the single tables there's a lot of action early on from other players. If you're being a rock and you're sitting back and waiting for your hands, you've probably got, if you're sitting in an eight, nine or ten-handed single table, you only need for a few people to go crazy early and bang, they're out of it, and all of a sudden you've probably only got three more people to take on and you're in the money. The only problem with the multi-table is there's no way you can sit back and wait for 340 people to knock each other out. You've got to be a bit more creative, a bit more inventive, because it isn't just about survival. Survival is a big part of multi-table tournaments, but you do need to be accumulating chips. You have to get involved in more hands, um, because everybody else will be. And for every 100 players that leave the tournament, that means that there's 100 players collecting their chips, or there is at least a number of people accumulating those chips. And the problem you'll find is when you get to like maybe the middle stages of a multi-table onward, you're there because you've not got involved in any hands and you've survived, but you don't have enough chips to actually like get involved in the action because all these other guys have been far more active and they've started accumulating chips, and every hand you go into, you're the short stack, you, you're up against people that could potentially knock you out. And it's a different kind of game. Um, when you get down to the real last stages, like the last kind of two tables, say, of a multi-table, that's when you can afford to ease off a little bit, like tighten up a little bit more. But to be honest, that early to middle stage of the multi-tables, you've got to get involved in more hands because everybody else will be. Uh, and also, to a certain degree, you have to have a, a lower expectation with multi-table tournaments. As we said earlier on, they have a much bigger payout but as you have so much of a bigger field to actually beat, you can't expect to, to finish in as many. And to finish like every three or four out of every ten sit and goes you go finishing the money, that's a pretty reasonable expectation. To always expect to finish in the money up against 350 opponents is not a reasonable expectation. But you know that if you make it one out of every hundred, you're going to make, well, in this instance, $940 for a $10 buy-in. You don't need to finish every single hand in the money to still make the multi-tables a profitable way to play. Yeah, well, thanks for getting in touch, Jeb. And I think if we go and look at our multi-table tournament, we can see if we can learn some tips on Indeed. how to play them the best.
yeah, it's a very, very different, very different game. Multi tables. So there we go. This one that we're watching now, Poker Night Live. Ten dollars to buy into this tournament. We started off with three hundred and forty two runners. The starting stack was fifteen hundred. And the blinds go up every 12 minutes. So it's 30 places will be paid. And first prize is $940. Yes. So that's how we started. Indeed. And we now have 101 players. Right. So a huge amount of the field has uh, disappeared. Two thirds gone. Indeed. We're down to uh, just 13 tables now. 101 players. And the, uh, the smallest stack is struggling with 767 chips, which isn't really going to get in too many blinds. But we're actually seeing our, our uh, chip leader in the tournament right now, Henrik, sitting around in uh, seat number seven with just under 14,000 chips. See, now he is a player that if he chose to, he could afford to sit back slightly. See, Rosie's has taken over him with 15,000. Oh, uh, yeah, indeed. All right, make me a liar. <laughs> just point out my inadequacies. <laughs> I'm sure he'll be back to the chip leader in just a minute. <laughs> you just want the boy to be winning. <laughs> no, no, hey, you know, Rosie could just be a very... a man who's very much in touch with his feminine side. So there we go, the blinds, 150 and 300 now. Um, it's amateur night tonight, so there's probably going to be a lot of brand new players watching. So, obviously, a lot of... The viewers will know exactly what the blinds are, but some people won't, and they might think we're talking absolute gobbledygook. So, do you want to give a, a brief explanation of what the blinds are, Matt? It would be my absolute and utter pleasure. Oh, thank you. Okay, so the <laughs> blinds are a mandatory bet. In many poker games, the, the first sort of poker games most people learn, you have an ante, which means there's six of you sitting there, and if you want to play, then it's going to cost you something to play. So you put your money in, and you will get your cards. With the blinds, it's a different situation. These are forced bets, and they are really there to get the action going so that you can't just sit there checking your way through the whole situation. The dealer button you can see moving around there. That moves around a player every single hand. That moves around the table in an orbit. The player to the immediate left of the dealer button is the small blind. Yep. And the so dealer to their left Kenny is the big blind. It's Kenny in this one. So, yeah. So, we see Kenny here. And as we know, the, the levels are 150, 300. The small blind's 150, um, and then Henrik is 300. And what that means is that in that round, the, the betting actually starts with Rosie, and she's looking down and seeing that actually somebody has made a bet before her. Though it's an enforced bet, there's still a bet of 300 on the table. So anybody that wants to play in this first round of the game has to at least match that, that big blind. And again, we spoke about how the fact the blinds go up during the tournaments to put pressure on people. And as that dealer button moves around, all of a sudden the blinds are slightly bigger and slightly bigger and a slightly bigger proportion of your chips. And it just puts pressure on everybody to actually like get involved in the action. But it's mostly there to force the action and to build up the pot into something that's worth fighting for. And of course that's the main difference with the tournaments and the cash games like in the tournaments. The blinds do go up and the cash games they don't. They stay the same depending on what cash game you're playing in. Aye. Aye, he says. <laughs> So 150, 300, but they will be going up every 12 minutes. So we're going to see um, things moving around in this tournament very, very quickly. So if you've got a question, you know, that you'd like to ask, even if it is as simple as what are the blinds, what's that little white thing there with the D in it, if you're a brand new player, then, you know, you can ask those simple questions as well. That's what we're here for. It's amateur night tonight. So we want to help some of our new players learn some poker. There's the text number if you want to send them through to us, 62211, or email poker at pokernightlive.co.uk. And don't forget the theme of the show tonight, our little bit of silliness. Indeed. Don't forget we're looking for your non-poker playing celebrities, fictional characters, favourite cartoon characters. Who do you think will make a good poker player, but why? More importantly, why? We don't mind how silly it is. 
we encourage sleep. We've already had Lindsay suggesting that Uri Geller could use his powers, <laughs> in inverted commas, to bend back cards. Corky says, people I think would make great poker players. I think the fact that Gandhi was willing to go on long hunger strikes and was ambitious enough to envisage the liberation of India from the British Empire would mean he would probably be able to make disciplined folds and take a long-term view in his poker strategy. I also think that Jordan would be good because she's shown how much she can achieve with a big pair. Oh, oh good stuff. Thank you, Cor. Keep, keep them coming through. Uh, we want to have a bit of a laugh tonight. We're going to go um, to a $2 sit and go now. Let's have a look at this. Yeah, I don't think we should linger on the Jordan comment. <laughs> you, you've already had a Pamela Anderson um, in there. The Gandhi one was very well thought out, though. Really? Yes, oh, I gosh, thought yeah, so. Oh, gosh, yeah, no, absolutely. That was scary. He could make discipline folds and take a long-term view in his strategy. Blimey. Very good. Thank you for that, Cor. Far too intellectual. I was expecting Scooby-Doo <laughs> and Spider-Man. And all of a sudden we've got Gandhi in there. I liked it, I liked it. So here we are, folks, on a, a nice little $2 single table tournament. Now, I like watching this, you see, this is about my level. I entered a $20 one and uh, went out after the first hand, so I tend to stick to the $2. <laughs> well, you know, the, it really depends on the players you get. Just because you're on a lower limit game doesn't necessarily mean you're up against, you know, Lesser players. You see some great play in the two dollars. Actually, you can get, I, you know, I had the most ludicrous. I had one of the best ends of a tournament the other day, and I'm pretty sure that was. It wasn't. I don't think it was two dollars. I think it was five. Like $5. Yeah, no, you see some it, it really was, good players like in the a, five dollars. I was having my soup, <laughs> and I thought, well, I don't really want to like stake my car on any game, but I'm going to have a quick muck around, and it got down to three of us, and it was fantastic. We got down to three of us very quickly, so the blinds weren't really. A problem for either of us, yeah. or any of us, should I say? And it just was great. And there were some really great moves, and some people making some really kind of aggressive plays with junk and showing it. And, and that's the thing is, if you get the right kind of right kind of players, you can have just as good a, a game on a two dollar tournament as you can with a you know a five hundred dollar tournament. Probably so, more fun, I would suggest. Yeah, maybe. no, definitely. I do like them. And the, the ones we show on Poker Night Live, we always have eight players start off, and the blinds go up every ten hands. You can see there at the top, we just explained what they were before for the new players. They're 10 and 20 at the moment, but different to the multi-table tourney, it's not on a time limit, it's, it's how many hands for this Absolutely, one. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So every 10 hands, these uh, guys are going to see the blinds go up. And they start with 1,000 chips as well on this one. Yeah, and you'll find that with most tournaments, the, uh, the higher the buy-in, then the more chips you'll get to play around with. But here it's but a thousand. But the kind of two dollar, five dollar ones, it's normally a yeah. thousand, isn't it? Yeah, it's normally a thousand. I think sometimes we've seen some of the tournaments where you get about twelve hundred or fifteen hundred, but a thousand's a good number. I mean, and it is a good number because you get plenty of play. Um, you know, you can make some sizable raises without losing and ended up with not enough chips to continue. Yeah. Um, and of course, here you've got eight players, three of which will get paid. Um, and it's a pure knockout. So once you lose your chips, that shell lot gets your coat. Yeah, so that's the chips underneath the names there, and that's chips, not dollars. Yeah, and if you are new to, to Poker Night Live, the easiest way to try and follow the action is the dealer button shows you where the action starts from. We've already explained the blinds in that first round of betting. And you go around the table in a clockwise fashion, and where you see the, uh, the bar ticking down, that shows you the, the player that's currently active. That, that bar is on most sites. You do have a, uh, an amount of time to make your move. So here we see the dealer is Hiram down the bottom. You come round to three and four o'clock on the board and you can see their timer ticking down as they decide what to do with it. And we can see we've already got one player down. Everyone else, I mean Dabba's got a nice chip lead there, but everybody else has got plenty of chips to play with. Um, we've lost Spider Mac. And that, that, that time limit, it's longer than you think, because I think that was one of the big mistakes I used to make when I first started playing, was I was playing far too quickly, thinking it's yeah. too, as soon as it came out to me, I had to jump in and make my move straight away. You have got time to think. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, people might be typing in ZZZZ because you're taking all of your 30 seconds, but the truth is, you, you know, you might want to replay what action happened. You know, if, if you're acting on the turn or the river, you want to just remember how did the betting go to this stage in case that tells you anything. Um, also, you, you can't give away anything like the amount of information you can give away in a live game. You know, yeah. everyone's sort of very hooked up on these tells and I'm really worried I'm giving off huge signals. Online, the biggest tell you can give away is about the speed of your action. And, and pretty much all of the online sites give you the option to like, you know, check a box that says, I've already decided what I'm going to do. When it gets to me, just check or bet. 
And I really strongly advise against that because you can get so much information off that, especially things like when you're on the big blind and you've clicked on check or fold, which basically means I haven't got much of a hand. If it costs me nothing to carry on, then allow me to do yeah. so. But if anyone bets at me, just fold me. Because you know that if that guy, when it gets around to him, it just instantly checks and the flop comes down, you know that he's just got rags. You know that you can't really make any assumptions. Free. Yeah. yeah, I wouldn't be here unless it wasn't for the big blind. Yeah. Um, and if you get a player that does that a lot, you might want to just remember that whenever he's the big blind, make a minimum raise. Because if he's hit that box saying check or fold, he's automatically going to be out the running. Yeah. If you've got a hand that's good enough that you want to take it to the flop, just make a raise on it because you'll clear out some of these guys that are just sitting waiting to check if it's free. Because if you end up with four or five people in the hand and the, and the flop comes down, you know, bits and bobs, you just don't know where you stand. Yeah. Any of these guys, they That's might a good point, have, actually, because I a, sometimes do that. It's, yeah, it's a dangerous thing to do. And it, again, it, it assumes that anybody is paying attention. But a bit like the guy that sits down and automatically posts the big blind when he doesn't have to. Yeah. Or the girl that does the I don't the do it all the time. The, the times I do, and that's a really good point, I'm going to stop doing it now, is, is before the flop, if I know I've got rubbish, I'll, I'll click, I know I'm going to fold it. Yeah. Or check or fold. You know, I'll stay in for free. But that's a good point because then if I do stay in for free, they, they know that I've done it automatically, so it's probably not very good. Yeah, or the fact is if all of a sudden you come out, because imagine, again, pick on this one particular example I've laid out. Imagine you're the big blind, and yes, you have just stayed in because it was for free. You're going to be either the first or the second person to act. Yes. So the truth is, if I see that you went clink, and you obviously were just checking or folding, if suddenly you bet, well, you've just gone from somebody who is ready to throw it away if it costs them any money to somebody who's hit something. Mm. Because you're not going to transform from somebody who's about to throw away to somebody who's going to start bluffing me and throwing chips at me. Yeah. So You're handing reads on a plate to the other players by doing it. I never thought of it like that before. The, the only time I would ever use that is if I, if I know that I'm just going to fold. Mm. If I've really got junk in my hand, I'm just going to fold it. But again, you have to be careful for that. Oh, my God. Look at that. Bang. We're down to our guys in the money here. Now, I think some things happened there because we couldn't have, we couldn't have gone that quickly. Good lord, there was carnage. It couldn't have gone that quickly. Look at the blind, 326.40. That's gone wrong. Okay. Do, we'll, do, do you know what I thought? Oh my god, there must have no. been a monster hand there. You, you didn't miss anything, definitely not. Okay, well, uh, I think we've decided to take you forward to the action, folks, because all of a sudden we're down to our last three. Well, these are all in the money anyway, so it's probably a good point to look at it from. And, uh, <laughs> exactly. Exactly, it's well, and it's not too, it's not too uh, scary here because there's some good chip stacks, so there's plenty of game left in here. Yeah, it's probably going to be a good three-handed three -handed game, this, because we've both got quite a few chips. Exactly, well, there's been a culling. <laughs> there was, there was a Mind you, the last time I was on, I saw the quickest tournament ever, and this was for real. It oh, lasted yeah. 20 minutes. Oh, yeah, they can happen, can't it they? It did, yeah. 20 minutes, and it, it was brilliant to watch, though. It was really, really good. It just sort of... I don't know, it just it was so fast and so pacey and really exciting. And to watch it, I was like, the end of it, how long did that last? And it was literally 20 minutes, because normally they're about 45 minutes, yeah. aren't they? Well, that's the thing, especially where, I mean, you know, we, we've only got eight players on the table to start with. You can assume that one's going to be a maniac, i.e. is just going to kill himself. You know, there's so many players that will knock themselves out. And what you tend to find is that if you do get one of those situations where you've got three players with big hands, is one of them can take two out at once. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you're down to five, and then you've only got a couple of spaces to go to the bubble. So, I mean, these sit and goes. They, they can, and that's the, the game I was describing before. You know, you get down to three players, and the blinds are still very early in their, in their sequence, so there's plenty of play still to go. But the, the bubble being the, the place before the money. Absolutely. The cover, you know, if there's three places being played, nobody wants to come fourth. You'd almost rather be tenth than fourth. Yes. Because if you get knocked out early, well, there you go. But if you've played all the way, especially in the multi-table, you've just dedicated the last four hours of your life. Yeah. And they paid the top 20 and you come 21st. It's a horrible place to be. Mm, I bet. But we're down to our heads up guys here. So Fast Bandit has got a bit of a chip lead here. We're going to be fast and furious now. <laughs> so... Well, he's slowly nicking chips here. Mm. The thing is, Grimbold probably, or is that Grimboid, is uh, probably being a bit guilty here of 
waiting for the hand to make a move with. Now he's only got th about three big, no, well the blinds have just well, the, gone the up, sorry. The blinds have just gone up and, and that's again, we make this point that says, you know, you can't wait. You uh, can't uh, wait. I mean, actually he's got himself a bit of a bit of a piece of this. He needs, needs a, diamond. a diamond or a nine, which mm. he does not get. So it's, oh actually tell the lie, it's going to be a split, oh no it wasn't, a, was that a split pot? That was a split pot, sorry about that folks. See, we're, see, we're gonna we're gonna wave, <laughs> wave, wave. We're going Can straight back to the heads up. I want to see the end up. of it now. Can we go? Oh, Just visiting. yeah, we can yeah. Go. I, it was. Do you know what? We had this conversation earlier on about how it's easy to to miss to stuff. miss the the best five cards. And look hands. here, look and grim. We were about to write him off. Now Bingo. he's got his flush. He's not flushed with exactly. the ace. And now look, he's suddenly got himself three and a half thousand. See, we were, we had our coats on there, folks. We were already. <laughs> we wrote him off. We were off. We were off down pub, <laughs> but uh, no, see, it's like it, it. we, we wrote him off and he came back from the dead. He's the chip leader. But it was, uh, what happened there was that, that we missed so quickly was that there were actually two pairs on the board and an ace. So in fact, they both had two pairs with the ace kicker, yeah. which overrode any of the, the cards they had in their hand. And as we, uh, as we swished away in a visual extravaganza, <laughs> I just noticed that actually it was a, a split pot. Now that's a great example of what we were saying earlier on about how you should always be watching for the best yeah. five card hand because even if it's on the board, it yeah. doesn't matter. And, and, the, and what it is, is it's because you're looking, and I can't actually remember what, what Grimm needed. He, needed. he needed a diamond or a nine or something. Yes. And you're going, diamond or a nine, diamond or a nine. And when it isn't one of those two cards, you just, that's it. You forget and about what's, you forget what's, to, yeah. that, again, you've got seven cards to make your best five from. So it, it is, but it's so easily done. There but you look, go. These boys are going to battle it out now, but the blinds are pretty juicy. Pretty huge now, aren't they? 640 and 1,280. So it's, 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 they look like they've got decent stacks, but when you look at the blind, they haven't at all. There you go, Gimroy's gone in with his queen two. But uh, Bandit doesn't really want a bit, <laughs> bit of the action. And that's the thing, you know, is that all the chips, you know, eight players, all of those chips have been distributed down to these last two guys. But because of those blinds, at this point, you know, we, we were about to comment on how Gimmard kind of sat back and left it too long. You leave it too long to make you move. And you haven't got enough chips to, to make any damage. And Gim has now won it. He takes it. Yeah. We wrote him off. We did. And wrongly. Wrong, and now, now this time we're not joking. He he really did. <laughs> he really that is has. the game over. That's it. No more game. We no promise. Game. We promise. But Sorry, then. Gim. Well done, mate. Sorry, we wrote you off before your time. Yeah, but a good lesson to be learned there. Exactly. Don't Keep. get focused on those cards in your hand. Always look for the best five card hand. Absolutely. Right. We're going to go back to the MTT. Yes, let's see how we go. Multi table tourney. Let's have a look. So blinds at 300, 600. Who we got here? Vince, Scotty, Canny, Rosie still up there, K-Dog. I mm. am a fish. So Ian Henrik has taken uh, the chips back off Rosie. Yeah, 19,000. No longer the chip leader, but pretty darn close. Yeah, K-Dog's looking quite good there, isn't he? 21,000. Yeah, 300, 600 again, you know. K-Dog is the chip leader of the, the whole tournament, not just on this table. And don't forget as well, folks, for a bit of a laugh tonight, we want to know which celebrity or character, non-poker related, would make a great poker player and why. We've already had suggestions of Gandhi and Jordan, Carol Vorderman, pa Pamela Anderson and Darren Brown. So we want your, your theories. Which celebrity would make a great poker player and why? You can send them through to us. Text us 62211 or email <coughs> poker at pokernightlive.co.uk. But the key there is why. Exactly. We want, you know, we're looking for you to be creative, guys. Come on. None yeah. of these easy questions. There's no, there's no quiz. We want, we want you to be using your brains. Yeah, Corky's, Dazzless. Corky's been the best so far, definitely. So get those minds working. Yeah, Corky. Corky went for it, didn't he? He wasn't looking around with his answer. No, certainly not. And we're down to about 60 players here on the uh, multi-table, so still, still a way off the, uh, the, final, the final gang, but it's starting to get serious now. And the top 30 players are going to get paid out here. So again, half the field before you're in the money, and to be honest, the early stages of the money aren't, aren't too exciting anyway. You should never be... Uh, 
so fixated on getting in the money that you forget why you're here. Because for $10, 30th place will give you $23.94, which is fine. Yeah, of course. You know, it's more than double your investment, but you really want to be there up in the top couple because that's where it gets pretty juicy. Makes a big difference, doesn't it, money-wise, definitely. Yeah, that's, um, that's the rest of your lives. $10 tournaments taken care of. You'd have to be pretty unlucky to get through $940 worth of buy-ins without another victory. But if you're good enough to beat 342, you should be able to take a few more boys down. So all the jacks out there, jack four, jack four, jack three. We don't like bad jacks, do we? Uh, jacks are bad. E even if there were two of them in your hand, it's still, it's still easily beatable. Mm. A lot of people get into trouble with jacks. Treat it as a premium hand and it's just, that's fine. But imagine what the flock could do to you. But we've got some big chip boys here, so these, are, these people know what they're doing. Yeah, there's no one really in dire straits yet, is there? No, this table is... Um, any single one of these players is a threat to the, to the others. There's no, there's no one that's really a target, because even our weakest chip stack here has got 8,000. And if any of these guys suddenly got asked if they want to play for 8,000 chips, that's quite a scary proposition. So we talked before we went to the break, you mentioned a little bit about position. Mm. Um, it's amateur nights and lots of people thinking, what do they mean? What's position? What's a good position? What's a bad position? Well, simply put, the earlier in any betting round you are to act, the weaker you are because you have no information about your opponents, all the pressure's on you. Um, you know, the best position to be is actually on the button. And when we say on the button, what we mean is that you're in the dealer position, which is shown there by the D. And the reason that's the best position is because you're always going to be last. For every subsequent betting round, you're going to be the last to act. If all of your opponents have checked round, you might sense weakness and you make a move. If somebody is, if you were about to go crazy and someone's gone all in, you might suddenly think your pair of jacks, maybe I'm up against aces or kings mm. or queens. Or, so it just, it's such a strong position. And you need to be aware of it because the worst state to be in is where you kind of got vaguely involved in a pot with some less than brilliant cards. And oh my God, suddenly you're first to act. And if you check, you think there are people behind you that are gonna bully you. If you try and steal it with a bet, there are people behind you that could raise, and all of a sudden you're thinking, oh, what have I done? I didn't even want to be in this pot. And yeah. So the truth is, the earlier you are, the stronger your hand has to be, or the bigger your edge needs to be. So if you really think, I rule this table, I understand everybody, how they think, what their actions are, what cards they hold. Other than that, you know, don't be playing weak hands in early positions. It's very simple. The earlier you are, the stronger your hand needs to be. So K's are there in Perfect. late position with pair of kings. Yeah. Great and stuff. See, the fact that lots of people have folded around, so he's not going to get max action. If he'd been earlier to act, he might have raised. Here he's actually chosen to slow play because he knows he's only got a couple of opponents, so to make much money out of this, he's going to have to be a little bit sneaky. Mm. And that, I'm sure, is what's made him decide to slow down. As it's gone, he's actually turned it into a straight. But sadly, he's, I mean, I am a fish living up to his name there, paid him off for a few more bets than he should have done. Yeah. He hit a poor, small pair of sevens, ace and ten are down, a queen's down, now a jack's down. But K-Doc, because of his position, maybe if K-Doc had been earlier to act there, he wouldn't have found anyone to play with him. Yeah. Because he might have thought, pair of kings, I'll raise it up, because the textbook says raise it up, and everyone would have folded. But because he's late in position, he sees that most of the table are gone. If he's going to make any money, he needs to maybe slow play a bit. Slow playing can be dangerous, because if aces come down, all of a sudden he can't assume he's the winner. But it, it makes a big difference. And again, it's one of those things that only really becomes apparent once you've played enough hands that you, you really get a vibe yeah. for how much different. But it can totally transform the hand you play. And it's something when you're, when you're starting out to always be aware of, to look at your position at that particular hand and, and look at who's acting before you. And, and sort of, like you said before, if you're, if you're in early position, then you do have to have better cards, really, don't Absolutely. you? Absolutely. And here it's like, you know, we've got pocket aces, and for every single one of those betting rounds, he gets to go second. He gets to see if Scotty's checking into him because he's not hit anything. He gets to see if Scotty's made a bet that he wants to raise on top of. He just, he has as much information as anybody can do. 
And that's why we also we talk about one of the things that I think a lot of, of beginning players do is making up the small blind. Yeah. <laughs> because they think, well, I'm in for 300. It's only going to cost me another 300 to see the flop. And, well, that's just not a great logic to work in because that's true. But regardless of whether you make the hand or not, you're still first to act. And we already know because we've just discussed it. It's the worst mm -hmm. place to be. So just get into the habit when we talk about these mandatory blinds is that you don't have the option. That's the cost of being dealt cards for that. And if you don't like your cards, just throw them away. Don't allow the small blind to influence you. Because if you suddenly decide that you're going to have a, have a play with it, you're probably just the worst thing that can happen to you in that situation. You play 10-7 because you were the small blind and it only cost me a little bit to see some more cards. The worst thing is if you actually hit something. Because yeah. then you're married to the hand, you've got money invested in the pot, and you're far, far less likely to be able to throw that away if faced with some sort of, you know, obstruction, somebody starts betting at you, you think, well, I've already put 600 in the pot and I have got a pet. The best thing to do is if you don't like your hand, regardless of whether you're in the small blind or they're suited, if you don't like your cards, just get rid of them, move on, wait for your hand to come. Do you need to get involved? No. Is it killing me? If you've only got 1,000 chips left and the small blind is 700, then fair dues. Get your chips in. You shouldn't get to that stage anyway. But mostly the small blind, it's going to be a pretty small part of the actual total number of chips you have. So just let it go and wait for the moment. The next hand, you're going to be the button. You're in the strongest position. Then you can start being a bit more creative. But don't get, you know, don't allow yourself to get into a habit of always calling the small blind just in case. Fingers crossed. I've got rags, but I've already got money in. I may as well make up the difference and see if I get lucky. Don't yeah. do it. It might seem like you're just making it up, but it, you know, over time, <laughs> it adds up. And Absolutely. It's... If you do that every single time it comes around, well, that's just going to you know, leak your chips away. Yeah, big, big thing to learn. Right, we're going to have hmm. a look at a bit of a cash game now. It's a 50 cent, $1. Ooh. There it is, 50 cent, $1 cash game. Look at it. Looks pretty. Snap it there. Crumble, we've got four king there. Yeah, a few familiar faces. Well, not faces. If only we knew what they look like. A few familiar, fam names. familiar names. Yeah, I think people should have the option to be able to put a little picture up beside them. Do you? A big pun? I think people should have the option to be able to put a little photo up well, beside them. Well, that's the them. future. In the, in the future. In the future. I think that would be a really good idea. When we travel around in hovercrafts or some such thing wearing silver boiler suits. I think that's the truth, you know, when people get more of their whole webcam mm. stuff and, you know, you get little faces. But... The only problem is you wouldn't, be able to, you wouldn't know whether it was really them, whether they were just putting on this picture of this beautiful supermodel well, exactly. or this rippling muscled hunk just to try and... Oh, you've seen mine, have you? <laughs> mm. Yeah, well, the truth is, I think, you know, it's, it's a bit like the guys that qualify for big live tournaments online. They don't want anyone to see their face <laughs> or, or how they act because, you know, in the, in the comfort of your own home, in your pants and socks, playing multi-table <laughs> tournaments, you win, you can jump up and down. If you lose, you punch your screen. You know, guys get out there to a live game and they're just totally paranoid about my tells People and see, how I yeah. act. And, and also, online, you can't act out of turn. You can't bet the wrong amount because all these things appear as big buttons hovering in the screen. But my favourite viewer, Cam Calder Steve, films himself when he's playing online so you can study his poker face and see what if he's given any tells. Are you wins. sure this is a poker thing? This isn't. No, this is this is a real genuine viewer. He posts on the forums and stuff, and uh, he, he sends some great emails into the show, and he genuinely filmed himself. Really. Playing in yes. his socks. <laughs> I don't know what. I don't know what he was wearing. I've, I've begged him and pleaded with him to send him the video of it, but he hasn't done it yet. <laughs> but I okay. would love to know. Well, no, hey, that's fair news. It's, you know, you've got to take it seriously. Perhaps just a mirror might mm. make things a bit easier. He also did a test on himself called the 3W test, where he played for a week. Um, <laughs> he played for a week. Um, the first week, drinking wine. <laughs> the second week drinking whiskey and the third week drinking water every time he played. I thought you were going to say white spirit for a minute. There, but <laughs> no, okay. but this, Please and continue. the statistics proved with the water he was the much, much better player and was more successful. Slightly um, worse with the wine and then disastrous with the whiskey. Now, I mean, it sounds like a lot of fun, but let's be really honest. Do you have to do that test to actually know what the results would be? No. You know, I think I mean, it was just an excuse for a drink. It's, it's good fun. Perhaps if you did it, you know, um, for the next six weeks, I'm only going to play drunk. And conclusively, I was rubbish. It's, you know, I probably could have guessed that that would be the... Uh, and then again, a lot of people find a drink, loosen them up a bit. You know, they get a bit more aggressive if they're having trouble uh, 
Actually, no, I'm going to take that back. No, you never play better when you're drunk. <laughs> I've, I've seen, I've seen some, some hideous play out of some quite good players once they've had a half a shandy. Mm, you never know. And of course, don't forget, we want to know which celebrities, non-poker related, which celebrities or characters do you think would make a great poker player and why? Would it be Yui Geller, because he could bend the cards around and have a sneaky look, or Carol Vorderman? Yeah, you're, you're fixated with this Carol Vorderman thing, aren't you? I don't know, I don't know, I just thought she'd be really, really good. Got a great email off Anubis, who says, I reckon having someone like David Copperfield at the table could be a winning formula. If you cut them a deal, they could make everyone think or see that you have aces every hand. And also, I think Huggy should make, um, divert their interests and make some poker pants, adult pull-ups. Or do you recommend putting your computer near the toilet? Well, it's an interesting <laughs> thought. See, there was me. I was, trying to, I was trying to broadcast this hideous vision of men in their pants and socks. <laughs> and there you are. You've got to beat me to it with an adult nappy. Um, I would suggest a, a wireless laptop that you can take to the toilet with you, frankly. Oh, yes. Or just, just sit out for a couple of hands. I mean, it's really not going to kill you. You know, just, just put it on, you know deal me out, just nip to the loo, come back. I mean, you've got to be prepared for these things. I, I spoke to a, a, you know, I mentioned earlier on about having interviewed the, um, the guy that was one of the World Series yeah. champions. And uh, I did a whole week of interviewing various different people. And one of the questions I was asking them was about, you know, what's your preparation before a game? And there was one guy, this Italian guy, and uh, he goes for a 20 minute run, and then he has an hour long shower. I stand in the, I stand in the <laughs> shower for an hour, just kind of the water hits me and I gather my thoughts. It's getting really oh, wrinkly. Wow, okay. Possibly so, his hands like prunes, he can't get his, pick his tips up. But then when I spoke to Greg Raymer, he was like, well, I need to take care of some important stuff, like finding out where the toilets are, so that in the breaks I know I can go straight to the toilets. And I was like, very practical. And also he likes to know when the food is, because if you know, if they're starting to play at noon mm. and there isn't a food break until six o'clock, then he makes sure that he stuffs his face at about a quarter to 12 yeah. so that he's not hungry, or he takes a bag of bananas takes something with him. with him. I was like, well, you know, all these guys are out there doing their zen and meditating and listening to rock metal. I prefer but the practical approach myself, is. though. Find out where your toilets are and have some bananas. You need, you know, you, you need to look after the basics. You need you know, to be able he's to a millionaire. Take... I'm not going to argue with him. <laughs> yeah, toilets, jobs and food. You've got to have a plan. Definitely. And here we find blocks with a pair of pocket eights, one of my, uh, my ludicrous but favourite hands to play. Still in the lead. All in here. See, again, about position all in. He's got to go first. He makes a bet. With the king on board, it's quite a brave bet, really, because he hasn't hit any of the board. But again, it's one of those calls where don't worry about making a bet, even if you don't think you're winning, because you might just learn something. Yeah. So there, he makes a bet. As it goes, it's enough that it scares off his opponent. Had his opponent called, at least he then knows that he is actually up against an opponent. So he still find out information. Exactly. Because even though he. And if he gets re-raised, then he knows he's in trouble and he folds. Yeah. But that investment is worth making because otherwise, if he checks and his opponent checks and a card comes down... He still down, doesn't know where he and is. And he checks and his opponent checks. And, and, and he checks and his opponent bets. and he, it, You just don't know where yeah. you are. And it's almost like you have to take some sort of affirmative action that says, I just need to know where I am. Yeah. And sometimes even making the minimum bet is enough because if somebody's got nothing... They're just going to get out yeah. of it. Uh, or, similarly, you make a bet the guy calls. You make a bet the guy calls. You show down and he's got nothing. So you know, you make a note, this guy is just kind of calling station. And that means he is likely to just keep calling bets just in case he gets lucky. So next time... You, and you know that yeah. next time, that if this guy calls, maybe it doesn't mean he's got a hand. If you, maybe you, when you're up against this guy, you need to make the bets bigger to really find out where he is. But just checking and checking and checking it really doesn't progress you. If you think you've got a hand that could win, put some chips in and find out. Because if you don't think you're winning, checking and checking and checking will probably result in a showdown with a tiny pot and much as you expected, you've lost. Yeah. And you've not even had the pleasure of really learning much about your opponent. Yeah, definitely. But here we see that Blocks has uh, made a set. Pocket pair has hit another card to make through of a kind. And the good news for him is that Jack Ali has actually also got a decent part of this as he's hit the king. He's hit his king, so he's probably going to pay him. He's going to... See, now it'd be interesting to see. So here goes. Jack Ali raises it up, and he gets re-raised very quickly. That's a got to be... A big re-raise. Uh, yeah, it is. It's, it's a massive re-raise. So Jack Ali's thinking, what am, and what he should be thinking is, what can I beat? Because right now I am done by king jack, king queen, 
king ace. Yeah. You know, if he's up against another ace, uh, sorry, up against another king, king ten, the ten isn't the strongest kicker. Yeah. And, he, and that's, that's that was a, a great fold. bit of move there because he does have a monster hand by rights. Forgetting that we've seen the guy up there who's got three of a kind, he has hit the best pair. He's got the top pair of kings and he's got a ten, which is not the worst kicker. It's not the strongest kicker, but it's not the yeah. worst. It's not like and there's king not all three. the cards on the board. And he makes a raise, which is totally the right thing to do, and he gets a big answer from blocks, which Straight is away. It's yeah. like, And again, we talk about the speed of your actions. Mm. Very quickly he re-raises him. Some people might read that as a bluff. It's like, bang, all in. But we were saying earlier on, very, very rare if someone's going to re-raise you like that. And, is it going to be a bluff? And Jack Lee, very, very good there. He's, he's made a fair investment in the pot. He gets a really strong reply from Blocks. And Blocks there probably should have slowed that down a bit. Yeah. Because he's, he's got himself a three of a kind, which is, you will see that more often than not, the hands that are winning these tonight, they're not straight flushes, they're not four of a kinds, they're not four houses. Most of these hands are going to be decided over single pairs, two pairs, and high three, cards. Yeah. It's you know. So to actually have flopped himself a four house, uh, sorry, flopped himself three of a kind there. To get somebody raising back him, he might want to just call and yeah. give this guy enough rope to, to hang himself. A lot of the time that's dangerous because the guy's hand might improve further. You give another him, king comes yeah. down or a ten comes down. But the truth is that by making that massive move. It's pretty much guaranteed to mm. end the action there. He's unlikely to get the guy call him. And the only way he's going to get called is if the guy's got him beat. Yeah. The guy's got three of a kind kings, he's going to get called. Anything other than that, a bet of that size is going to make the guy throw it away. So you've just got to decide whether, you know, it's a bird in hand, uh, two in the bush and all that. Do I get my money now and it's 100% guaranteed I've won? Or do I try and string it out, which can be dodgy, but you do need to accumulate chips. You can chips. give him the chance to outdraw you, though, if you do that, can't Absolutely. You? Well, again, you've got to balance it out, but sometimes winning it there and then is not necessarily maximising the opportunity. And if the nightmare happened there and you slow played and a king came down, maybe you give it up and you just put it down to experience. But you don't always necessarily want to go, I've won this, I've got the best hand, here are all my chips. Yeah. Because, yeah, you're going to win, but how much are you going to win? It's not just about winning, it's about making the best kind of profit. Maximizing out. Yeah, it, Maximizing yeah. that situation. Because it's like, you get some real kind of like crazy guys who go, wow, I've got a pair of aces. I'm all in. Fold, 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 fold. Ow. Okay. So, yeah, you won. S slight yeah. hand clap. But you didn't make anything for it. And it's not like you've got to be Cajun slow player, but don't overplay a winning hand. Make it make it expensive enough that you're only up against reasonable hands so that you can try and judge what they're on. Don't make it so cheap that anyone's just going to call and God knows what they're going to hit on the flop. But don't necessarily just think, I've won this, I'm going to put my chips in. Maybe it'll work for you every once in a while, but mostly you're just going to waste the opportunity to milk a bit more cash out. Because hands like that don't come around very often. Three of a, three of a kind doesn't no, come and, around very and, often. And we always get asked about, you know, you play something like pair of sixes or pair of sevens. That the trouble is you've got about a 90% chance of seeing over cards come down on the flop. So when you're playing those hands, you're either making a raise to try and just end the game there and take the blinds, or you are kind of limping in and crossing your fingers that you hit a set and then you can milk it. So when you do what that guy did, which was get into the hand, hit the miracle card, hooray, you then want to go, right, well, it's not often I do get into this situation. Let's make sure we get the most out of it. And chucking 40 chips in yeah. on top of a $14 raise is probably a bit kind of crazy. Okay, well, we're going to go back to our multi-table tournament. It's a green, mean, multi-table machine. There we go, blinds 400, 800 now, going up every 12 minutes. We've got a few empty seats. See, the, the fact we've got empty seats at this table, you can tell that the tournament's starting to break down because to have a table here, there's no doubt more tables with lesser you know, number of players. Yeah. Uh, and also just look at the, the volume of chips, even though we're at 400, 800, which is a few levels in, but not crazy. Um, but you know, you've got a guy here on 22,000 and 34,000. So blinds of 800 aren't really gonna like uh, scare him too much. Ace queen suited, very nice hand, raised it up. And that's a really great one. Again, here we see the first piece of action is that I stood for doubles the blind, and then he gets a re-raise back. He's got ace nine. What range of hands do you put your opponent on who's taken your raise and doubled it up? It's, you know, warning flags in the air. Managed to keep it a bit cheap. 
So, a uh, bit of an update for you at this stage, because we're dipping in and out of this NTT. We started off 342 players, we're now down to 36 on five tables. Well, we. Uh, PUFC boy there on this table is the overall chip leader. And the smallest stack we've got at the moment is on 799. See, he hasn't even got the big blind by one penneth. So I think so we're going to be down to 35 players pretty soon. Well, you don't know. You remember the guy we wrote off earlier on, and, and then the he came back and came yeah. up and came back? Oh, no, the one that yeah. Exactly. So uh, you only need to double up once with 800, and you've suddenly got 16. Then you double up again, you double up. Um, you're going to need a bit of luck, but it can be done. Bang! That is not the hand that a pair of fives wants to see. We do lose another player. But... Again, he, he, he left it too late, but that all-in move wasn't scary enough, and he ran into a full house. Another player leaves us on the multi-table, and all the players jump up another position. And in fact, only a couple of spots to go until they're in the money, because we know that it's going to be the top 30 players get paid off yeah. in this tournament. So we must be very, very close to that bubble of actually getting some money for your trouble. Yeah, and a few sad faces as well we're going to have. Those people who've yeah. played for so, so long and are going to go home with nothing. OK, um, we'll get back to that anyway, and we will go to the conclusion of that multi-table tournament later on this evening. But we are going to look at some of your emails. This one is from Julian, who says, In your opinion, what is more profitable? Sit and goes or ring games? I enjoy no limit sit and goes, but for long term investment, would I be better off playing limit ring games? P.S. If I'm playing sit and goes, am I better off playing limit games instead of no limit? Well, it depends. What are you good at? I mean, the truth is, both playing in, playing in tournaments and playing in cash games are both profitable ways to play. Um, if you're brilliant at tournaments and you have a higher expectation of winning, then that's the place that I would suggest you as a human are more likely to, to succeed. As we've already spoken about with the tournaments, the difference is that in a tournament, there's only one way to make money, and that's to win the tournament. In cash games, you can make money every single hand. And some people prefer to sit for six hours and play in cash games where they go up, they go down, they win hands, they lose hands, but they're still in the running. Whereas we're talking about this multi-table tournament, for instance, you play it for three hours, you get knocked out in position 31, you've made no money for it. But Again, as we've already said, when you do get in the money, you're getting a much higher return for your investment. Also, mentality-wise, a lot of players like tournaments because it cost me $10 to get in. Here are my chips. You don't have to think about cash anymore. You know what it's cost you. It's not going to cost you anymore. In cash games, you need to be able to distance yourself from the actual money. When you're moving $5 in or $10 in or $20 in, if you're worried about that money, it's going to affect the way you play. So a lot of people starting up in cash games, you know, actually playing poker with real money, find that tournaments are a nice way in because you know exactly how much it's going to cost you. It's not going to get more expensive. Of course, with a cash game, you get knocked out, you can just reload, come back into the same seat you're at, put another $100 down and carry on, which can be a dangerous way of playing if you're not used to that, because all of a sudden you've been there for half an hour and you're $300 down and you didn't mean to do that. Um, no limit and limit, which one's more profitable? Again, it really depends what, what style you're better at. I'm, I personally rate myself as a single table tournament player. Um, I don't rate myself as a long limit cash game player. I prefer no limit. You know, it's going to be down to you to experiment with the different games that you can play, and you will learn which ones you enjoy more. I enjoy the pace of tournaments, and I think that's where I can make more profit. Um, if you're a grinder and you love sitting down for nine hours on a cash game, then that's probably the place to go. All of these, all of these, James Browning has made a career out of tournaments. Some of the other guys that, that are here on Poker Night Live think the cash games are the way to go to make profit. Depends what your style is and de depends where you enjoy the most success. Personal preference. Yep. Um, this one's from Garbis. He says, my question, this is something we've been talking a lot about tonight, uh, about position, um, is what hands do you feel playable in middle position and why? I'm a fairly tight player, playing only premium hands in early position and fairly high suited connectors in late position, but I'm not sure what to play when I'm in middle position. There's no real kind of single answer to that because that doesn't take into account any of the other things which are... What's your table presence like? What are the guys on your table like? Are they all rocks? Are they all loose? Are they all really aggressive? Um, we already know that, that middle position 
you know, early position we know that only strong hands are going to like be worth going for. In late position you can be a bit more speculative. In middle position it really depends what you know about the table. If you know you can limp in and get a few cheap flops then you might want to try playing anything. If you know that the guys behind you on the table are really aggressive and they're going to punish you for that sort of play, then you're going to have to tighten up a bit and just basically wait until you're in position or you've got powerful, powerful cards. We've already said you can't survive just waiting for premium hands. But if you're not waiting for hands, wait for position. Because if you're getting great hands, you can play them in any position. If you don't have great cards, then wait for the position that suits what you're trying to do. Yeah, definitely good stuff. Thank you for your email. Also, we've got a bit of a silly text and email topic tonight as well as your serious poker questions. We want to know which celebrity or character do you think would make a great poker player and why? We want you to send it through to us. You can text us, 62211 is the text number. Whew, there it is, 62211. Or you can email them through to us. There it is, poker at pokernightlive.co.uk. Got a cool text from Chefnik, who says, I think Pete Burns in a live game because his face would be unreadable. <laughs> Good stuff. Like the one that's going in the top three. We'll be ringing out our favourite top three at the end of the programme. That's not too bad at all. Yeah, I like that one. Thank you for that. Right, send it through to us. We're going to take a short break and we'll get back to some poker in a few minutes. So stick around and we'll see you then. Welcome back to Poker Night Live. I'm Lindsay, joined tonight by Matt Broughton. We're here with you till two o'clock. Indeed. We've got some good stuff so far. We've got a really good multi-table tourney going on and also cash games and sit and goes as usual. And of course, on Poker Night Live, we've got your emails and texts coming through to the studio because it's your show, whatever you want to talk about, whatever you want to ask, that's the way that we will go. So please do send your questions through to us if there's anything that you'd like to ask, no matter how simple. It is amateur night, so you can text us. 62211 is the text number. Whoosh, there it is. 62211. Or you can email. Whoosh, there it <laughs> <laughs> Whoosh, poker at pokernightlive.co.uk. And we're being a bit silly because it's Saturday night tonight and everyone else is out getting drunk. So we want to know which celebrity or character not poker related mm -hmm. do you think would make a great poker player and why? Now we had a great one off chess, Nick, who said Pete Burns in a live game because you wouldn't be able to read him. <laughs> <laughs> one can only assume that's your Pete Burns in person. <laughs> yeah. Uncanny. Uh, and Corky said Jordan because of course you can achieve a lot with a big pair. Boom, ching. <laughs> Uh, back to serious poker emails for mm. a minute, but if you want to send us your silly ones, we do want to hear them. Who would make a great poker player and why? Which non-related poker celebrity? Uh, this email is from Poker Wolf, who says, Hi guys, great show as usual. I've just played in a multi-table tourney and came 134th out of, get this, 10,000. But I feel I could have done better. The problem... <laughs> Whoa. Oh, yeah, rubbish. I think you're overcritical of yourself a little bit there, Poker Wolf. He says, the problem is, uh, when the blinds get big, i.e. 3,000, 6,000, I can't bring myself to call a raise with anything other than a premium hand. And these are few and far between, so I'm constantly short-stacked in relation to the blinds until I hit a good hand. Have you got any advice on how to overcome this problem? I'd keep doing what you're doing if you're doing 134. Wow. That would 10,000. 10, I really, if you if you could come back to us, I'd love to know how long did that take? Because 10,000 is a massive, massive uh, field for a for a free roll, um, and 134 out of 10,000 is is really not too shabby. <laughs> how many positions did they pay? Um, anyway, do let us know. I'd love to know a bit more about this. As far as getting to that situation. Um, two things. First of all, is obviously you're focusing here on the, this problem area. Go back to the levels before where the blinds were cheaper. This is kind of reinforcing something we said a bit earlier on, which was that you can't afford to miss the opportunity to accumulate chips earlier on. And this is a, my colleague Nick Walthall hates bad beats. And the reason he hates bad beat stories is because it focuses on the end, the hand where you lost. And what bad beats ignore is how you got into a situation where you were all in with, with a hand anyway. And this is kind of a similar thing, is you're scared of these big blinds, you're finding yourself self short stacked is that one you can try and be a bit more inventive earlier on to make sure you accumulate chips to give yourself more chips to play with at this stage and also if you are just sitting here now waiting for premium hands that's not going to be enough 
because if you don't get premium hands, you don't have a plan. So the other thing you need to be doing is looking for opportunities. And that might be due to position, you're in a late position and everyone's limping and you think I'm going to make a move here. Um, you might actually try it and I know it's going to cost you a lot of money but you're going to have to maybe move in with some suited connectors. See if you can hit something where you have a lot of people in, involved in the pot, you're late in position and what you have there is some great implied odds and what that means is that though it's costing you to get involved with a lesser hand, the good news is if you hit something, you've actually got great implied odds because you've got a lot of people involved in that hand. And if you do hit yourself a decent hand, you're going to get paid off for it. Um, the truth is, other than that, you're just going to have to get a bit more inventive. You're going to have to start being a bit looser, a bit more aggressive, because there will be, for sure, other players on that table with a similar stack to you who are similarly not getting good hands, but they're probably making more moves. They're probably putting pressure on you because they've sensed that you've tightened up. You're waiting for a pair of aces. And sod's law, as soon as you actually make a move, if you've been sitting still for an hour and not making a move, as soon as you make a move, they're going to go fold, 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 fold. Because what you're doing is actually building up a very accurate picture for everybody else, which is that you are just sitting there waiting for a premium hand. So the worst thing is, if you finally get that miracle pocket pair you've been waiting for, nobody's going to give you any money for it. So I think you are just going to have to loosen up a bit. Maybe grab yourself some books. There's some really great books out there on tournament play in the different stages. Don't just be insular and think, oh my god, because also the worst thing is, if you get this into your head that this is a problem, every time you get to this stage of a tournament, you're going to start thinking, oh no, I hate this bit of a tournament, this is why I don't get any hands and it's cost me a fortune, and you'll really kind of end up defeating yourself. So maybe just loosen up, get a bit more aggressive, try and push people around if you're getting pushed around yourself. But get back in touch with those Poker Wolves because we'd love to know more details about that 10,000 uh, players. Amazing field, yeah, tournament. we'd love to. Uh, Greg's emailed in, he said, I reckon the Dalai Lama would be a great pay, uh, poker player. He'd give off a table image of being spiritually good and pure, and he would be able to uh, bluff people uh, off a lot of pots. Well, no one would believe he's lying a pure golden heart. <laughs> he's going, all in, he's got junk. Not bad there idea. There you go, but thank you for that one. I prefer that uh, Pete Burns on myself. You Pete, can't Pete lose Burns him. is my personal favourite at the moment, along with your Yuri Geller, because it's just <laughs> mental. <laughs> So Pete Burns to beat everybody. Get, yeah. get cracking. Get thinking. Six double two double one. We want to hear them or email poker at pokernightlive.co.uk. Do you fancy seeing how the players are getting on on a multi-table tournament? I'd love to. We Ooh. must be in the money by now, surely. Let's have a look, shall we? Well, I am a fish. As uh, we've broken down tables because there's some names that we recognise, but they're in different positions. Yeah. The blinds are at six hundred and twelve hundred. Now we started off here, just in case you missed um, the bit earlier on where we started off playing, we had 342 runners, starting stack was 1,500 chips, $10 buy-in of course, and the blinds have been going up every 12 minutes. Now we had a total prize pool of $3,420, and the top 30 places are being paid. Well, we are in the money, because we're actually down to 14 players. Wow, so I am, the, I am a fish is actually the smallest ship. Down to our last two tables, I am a fish is the, the shortest stack. But now he has just picked up a pot. So, yep. that's, so um, we have Cash, who is in seat number seven, is actually our current chip leader in the tournament. Um, and SG145 must be the lowest now. Indeed, he, he, he is indeed. Um, and as I say, all these guys are now in the money cause for, for, because there was such a large field. And you'll find this with the tournaments, depending on the number of entrants, that dictates how many people get paid off. Um, and because we had over 340 runners, we've got the top 30 being paid. All of these guys in the top, uh, the 11th position to the 20th position all get the same amount. All these guys are looking at the moment at $30.78 for their $10 buy-in. Right. When it starts breaking down, is in the top 10. So all of these guys really... I mean, I would imagine most of these guys have got their eyes, their eyes firmly fixed upon seventh place because seventh place is where you jump up into getting a hundred dollars plus. So that's where you're getting a decent return on your investment for all this time you've spent staring at this green screen. Would you not be a bit cheesed off though if you came twentieth and you get the same amount as the person who comes twelfth? Because obviously you've done better, but you're getting the same amount. Yeah, but it just seems to be the way. I mean, in most tournaments, it is. It's the top table that you want to be on, uh, and I think it's it becomes 
because of the percentage, the way that these are broken down, is otherwise the difference between these amounts would actually be so tiny anyway. It wouldn't really make that um, much difference. That it would be $23.94, and the next position is $23.97. We're that, not going to argue over a few cents. Exactly. Mm. So, you know, I mean, it makes a big difference, you know, whenever you look at the, uh, the results of the big tournaments, where it's like, you know, 4,000 euros, $25,000 to buy into. Yeah. The difference between those, even those minor payoffs, that is worth fighting for. Um, but it's just the accepted norm. It's you know, it, it's not something that people generally squabble about because, to be honest, again, look at this example here. You're getting thirty dollars back for ten dollars. It's a reasonably small profit. Um, I mean, it's not bad. Again, you know, I forget the amounts we're talking about. It's you know, three times what you you went in for. Um, but people really do have their eyes on the prize, which is is the top positions, and it is quite juicy. You know, nine hundred and forty is is not to be sniffed at for a for a ten dollar buy-in. And 300 is a reasonable, you know, we've just heard from a guy who's been on a 10,000 person multi-table yeah, tournament, which I'm still hoping is a typo, because that, that sounds a ludicrous man, and he's kicking himself for only coming 134th. Blimey, mate. Well, think how many people you've out, outlived. But all these guys have got plenty of chips and cash. I mean, this is interesting, you know, because... Cash buy rights could really sit back here and let other lesser chips kick, kick themselves out, but it's such a dangerous way to play because all you're doing is watching other people accumulate chips. But you've seen it time and time. I saw a, a tournament, a live tournament on um, Wednesday night, and there was a guy, uh, the top four positions were getting paid out of what was down to a six-handed game. Yeah. And there was a guy who literally had some chips in front of him, not even enough to count. It was just <laughs> some chips. But... He actually threw away a big blind that was nearly all of his chips, but it gave him one more circuit of the table. And in that circuit of the table, other players knocked each other out. And it took him from somebody that you just wouldn't have given a chance in yeah. hell to actually stepping up through other people's eliminations. Into the money. In, into the money. And it's, it's one of those things that it's almost like people seem to think the beginning of a tournament is about survival, but actually survival can be a big part right at the end as well. You've got to really think about, do I want to put my tournament life on the line here or hang in here for position. It's not honourable, but it's profitable. So like cash there, 77,000 chips, he could, he can afford at this stage to sit back and let other people knock themselves out so he moves further up to the money. Absolutely, but I would suggest that anybody that's got to this stage with 77 grand is somebody who's going to be playing poker. Yeah. Um, and he does have the advantage here that no one at this table can actually bust him out of this tournament right now. Whereas pretty much anyone that goes up against him, he has that added, added sort of weight of, if you go up against me, I'm somebody that can, can kick you out. Um, so it's, you know, you, you've got to appreciate your chip stack. You don't want to go too kind of soft on, you, on, you know, on yourself. You don't want to suddenly slow down because you've got all this way with a big chip stack. You want to make use of that now and start pushing people around. Yeah, because... It, you know, just because you've got a high, high chip set doesn't mean that you ignore good cards or good situations that you're in. Absolutely. And the thing is, because the blinds, you know, the blinds will start going up and it's a real... Well, here's a good little heads up here, look. Yeah, pocket tens eights, and eights. Pocket tens. That's a big raise by, uh, by Kov, though. So, the problem is pair of eights. When the flop comes down, if there's a nine, a ten, a jack, a queen, a king or an ace, He's got to see himself as no longer in a strong position, so makes the right move there and falls out. Good fold, out. good fold. Yeah, absolutely. Do you know, I was telling you earlier on this evening about my favourite viewer, Cam Calder Steve, mm -hmm. who actually does film himself when he's playing online so he can study his poker face. Mm -hmm. And you thought I was joking. Well, he's been in touch with the show. Woohoo! Good to uh, hear from you, Steve. Cam Calder Steve has emailed in and he says, Hi, lovely Lindsay. And that other guy, Dormat, oh. Oh, he's getting off on a bad foot with you. He says, I think the invisible man would be a great poker player. You couldn't read him and you'd always be worried he was standing behind you looking at your cards. The major downside would be that no ladies would ever play poker in a skirt again. See, that tells me a lot about where you're coming from now. Yeah, that says a lot, a lot more about you than it does about the, uh, the email there. And he says, keep up the good work. The show is always better with Lindsay. Oh, she is my favourite presenter. And he says, P.S., I'm considering sending in a video clip just for Lindsay. Yeah. Do it! 
Do it, please. We want to see your poker face. Email it to us. Come on, poker at pokernightlive.co.uk. And I love you forever, Steve. Please do. <laughs> I'm actually quite worried about this. <laughs> Oh, he's good. Right, we're going to get over to a 50 cent one dollar cash game. Let's get off this subject now. Yeah, I think he could be waiting for you tonight. <laughs> oh, no, he's, an, he's a nice guy. No, I don't mean it, Steve. I'm sure you're, you're he's, entirely um, normal. He's, he's a good sport, is Steve. He's married with kids and, and a, a, <laughs> a pro properly soon. He just likes a bit of a laugh with us. And uh, we do appreciate your email, Steve. Always nice and light-hearted, which we do like now and again. Indeed, on a silly Saturday, that's what of we need. Of course we do. So there you go, the Invisible Man. Which celebrity or character, non-poker related, do you reckon would make a great poker player? We want to hear them. Whether it be Pete Burns, Darren Brown, or whoever you think. 62211 or email poker at pokernightlive.co.uk. There's our leaderboard there in our cash game, Jack Alley up at the top there, $175. Yeah. Now, what's, so it's 50 cent, one dollar. Yeah, so this is a step up. Earlier on we were watching the, the 25, 50 cent. So you can see, I mean, you can see here again the pot size already just lets you know that this, even by going one level up in, yeah. the, in the, the limits you're playing, it makes a big difference. Because before the average pot was some, somewhere between like kind of... That's 50, wasn't it? Um, no, 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 it wasn't even that. That beer was kind of like more around between like three and seven dollars you were seeing generally. Oh, sorry, I'm, I, was, I was on about the, um, the, the stack size, sorry, I got Oh, I see, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, I'm talking about the, the actual yeah. pot size, you know, of each individual hand, that even though it, it doesn't sound like much playing, a, you know, a 50, 50 cent, one dollar table, is that you're going to see that the average pot here can be up around the 20, 20 dollars. Yeah. So, again, if you're only sitting down with a hundred, you've only got to lose a couple of 20 dollar pots and that's... That's so a that's sizable chunk. the maximum sit down is a hundred. Yes. Hundred dollars. So Jack Alley. Uh, so you can see pretty much everyone here you, you'd imagine did sit down with a hundred. Yeah. Because most people are there or thereabouts. Four king ace, familiar name. Snap it again. These boys. So again, you know, these are some of the guys that we also saw on some of the other tables. So again, this whole kind of issue of multi tabling and how many people are playing more than one game and sitting in the tournaments at the same time. They keep themselves busy, don't they? They do. Busy bees, busy bees. Of itch there, we see quite a lot on Poker Night Live as well. And they're all in, I think, we're sitting in the same position on a different table earlier on. Mm. Not much for anybody there. Six eight took that down, I think. A power hand, if ever there was one. <laughs> Snap it with a pocket pair, but again in early position, he's on the big blind. He'd be lucky here if they um, they let him limp in with this, and he manages to hit something as it comes round. There we go. Pocket fours. Not hit anything now, though. It's quite a scary flop. It is, it's full of scariness and <laughs> Snap It we know is experienced enough that he'll appreciate that he kind of got in this for free and, and he's made actually... Made straight. Yeah, well, no, the, sorry, the, what, I can't see his name, Jack Alley's yeah, made Jack straight. Yeah, Jack Alley's got himself the straight. I mean, to be honest, with that board, any bet's going to scare you off with pocket fours. Yeah. Because Snap It's somebody who knows that it is only in it because it was a freebie. Um, and that's fine, you know, fine to be in that position, but you've just got to be so, so prepared to throw away. Um, because even if someone's bullying you, so what? You, you've yeah. just got such an easily There's so many hand. different hands which can be beating you, it's just not worth the risk. Absolutely. Definitely not. So, queen-king there for four-king. Five of them, wanting a bit of this pot. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's again, you know, that's what we were saying about, you know, you, you, you suss out the profile of your table, but it's pretty unusual. You know, if you think of any of the games we see, how often do you get down to the turn and you've still got five, five. players? You've only got eight yeah. players on the table. Um, but this is where we talk about position, like Jack here, if he makes a bet, you know, it, it comes here and he gets, you know, check, 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 check. 
Jack hasn't got an amazing hand, but he's got a queen, he's got a high card. He's actually got other cards on the table, but when you've got a bunch of people that have been this passive, if he made a bit of a few, I mean, here, look, Ovich has got nothing. Yeah. Oh, no, actually, tell a lie. <laughs> he has, he's, he's made himself the straight on the, on the river. Oh, yeah. Um, but at the time when it was on the turn, you know, Jack had the, he would be drawn to the flush, so exactly. it wouldn't even be it, an outright bluff, would it? He's, he's sitting there with 2-7, only because, only because it was like the small blind. But they keep it so cheap for him. Mm. And that's what I'm saying is if Jack just makes a bet, even if he makes a minimum or one or two dollars or something, if he gets a call, fine, we know where we stand, but you've got five people there just going, um, check, um, yeah, check. Yeah, so he should have. Uh, and at the end, the bull Ovich, by the horns, as it were. And, and, and Ovich bets, and actually he's got a hand, but if he didn't, everyone's kind of going, oh, yeah, right, then you win. And it's. Yeah. Passive play is a real nightmare. It, it, it's just. If you don't make moves, you just don't learn anything. You just yeah. keep checking and you keep kind of calling. And it's a big part of, of what I, I like to play is that even if you don't necessarily have a huge advantage in, in the, the hand, be the one in control. If you're somebody who is checking after someone's checked or if you're calling because someone's bet, you're just super passive and you're just sitting there seeing if you get lucky. If you're the aggressor, if somebody bets that you make a raise, if they give it up and go, well, it was worth a try, fine. If they re-raise you, you know you stand, but you're never learning anything. Mm. You're never learning anything about the players. You're never building any sort of presence for yourself. And you'll be like our guy in the email where he's waiting and waiting and waiting. And as soon as you do make a move, everyone will go, well, this guy's so passive. For him to make a move, he's got a hand. You're not going to get any action out of me. So you've got to think about mixing it up and every once in a while investing some chips mm. in making an image. Be the one to act. Don't just always react to, to what everyone else is doing. Absolutely. Because if people are watching, they'll, they'll notice your mannerisms. They'll notice when you like to get involved in which positions. So it's a big part of poker. Any, any of the guys that are really successful players, they, have, they don't just have one style. They, they're able to, to you know, change gears and, and speed it up a bit, slow it down a bit. We mentioned just before Poker Wolf, we asked him to email back and touch the other guy who sent the email in saying he was involved in a, a multi-table tournament with 10,000 players mm. and came 134th. Well, he's got back in touch and he says, thanks for the advice. He'll try and put that into practice next time. He says it was a multi-table free roll, which he was playing in, and it took just short of three hours when he went out and it was still running. There were 300 places paid, the lowest being $4.50, and the highest was $5,000. Wow, that for free rolls. I mean, that's the thing is... For online players now, online poker is a massive, massive business. Um, and the good news for us is that that means that all these guys are squabbling over your custom. Yes. So you do find some fantastic free rolls. And, and it kind of seems amazing that you can go through 10,000 in three hours. Yeah. But because it's a free roll, what you do tend to find is of those 10,000? Loads of nutters. Probably about 9,000 <laughs> nutters, yeah. You've got lots of maniacs because nobody wants to grind it out a free roll with 10,000 people. So you will find lots of people and all they're looking for is just a hand that's good enough to try and double up with. Going to double up, going to throw chips, throw chips, throw chips. The good news is those people are going to blow themselves up quite quickly. The bad news is some of those guys are going to succeed. Yeah. And all of a sudden you're back to our boy Poker Wolf who's sitting there short stacked because he's not a maniac. He's trying to play serious poker against lunatics. You're going to see so many people going all in, loads absolutely, of time. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. It's like if you ever play a rebuy tournament. If you're up against the worst sort of person is somebody who doesn't care about the money. They drive me mad. All in, I got busted, yeah. I'll buy back in. All in, I got busted, I don't care, I'll buy back in. And you're like, hang on a minute, I'm sitting here trying to play poker and you're just playing the lottery. And it's very hard to get your head around it and how to deal with those guys. The only um, good thing about that is that they're, they're building up the, the prizes, aren't they? Well, they are. That's the good side of it, is that that means on your table... But you it is have quite the, annoying. ..you have the potential to walk away to your next table with far more chips, because this guy is bringing chips to the table. Yeah. So if you do hit a big hand, and I've had it before, I sat opposite some guy a while back. Mental, absolutely mental. But the great thing was, he brought probably about... I don't know, five or six rebuys worth of chips to the table. Um, and then I managed to, uh, I flopped a, uh, a full house out of something, and of course he called. Yeah. And he had loads of money, and I'd accumulated some chips so actually I could make my value pretty good, and a couple of guys came with me because they were kind of lunatics as well. Yeah. Brilliant, bang, massive pot. And then I sit down, because then at some point you reach the end of your rebuy period, 
And this guy now has got to play poker. Yeah. And you've learned so much about him that actually is generally not a very good poker player anyway. He's just there because you've got the cash. And he's just spending the money, yeah. Uh, and, you know, and with these free rolls, again, you know, you've got to get... Oh, this guy, he said he came 134th. So, That's brilliant, isn't it? You know, if it was, it's nothing to enter. If you're saying that 300 places were paid and those was 450, do let us know what you made, mate. It's always great to hear from our viewers, to, to hear their successes and, you know, how much profit are you making? How well are you doing out there? Um, and, and how much time are you investing? Because... If you spent three hours for free and you came 134th, I'd love to know what you made, but 5,000, I mean, imagine the guy that picks up that, manages to take out 10,000 players, gets five grand for his troubles. It's fabulous stuff, so do abuse those free rolls, guys, because it could be you. Someone's got to win them. Better odds than doing the, uh, the lottery, and somebody still wins that every week, <laughs> or not. It's probably on its 19th week of rolling over now, isn't it? It's kind of lost the air. But we get so many emails and texts um, about people when they, when they have bad beats and losses. But we do love to hear when people have good wins, but they don't tend to email us in with those stories, do they? Well, that's what I'm saying. That's mm. the point I made earlier on. There's this, there's this very, very deep, I say I'm going get, to get very Casper on, on you ass now. <laughs> um, you know, there's this thing called loss aversion. There's this, there's this whole theory, um, prospect theory, which is big Nobel prize-winning economists came up with this whole thing. And one of the parts of this prospect theory is about loss aversion. That the pain of loss outweighs the joy of success by two and a half. And it sounds a bit stupid, but that's the whole point, is that saying most people, the pain you feel from loss is so awful that people won't gamble. Because yeah. even though they might win, the pleasure of winning is nothing like the pain of losing. And so what you end up with is that people only gamble when they are so low yeah. That they've got nothing to lose. They, it's almost like I've decided I'm dead. I've hardly got anything left. And all of a sudden, <laughs> these guys that have been tight as suddenly start mixing up and getting kind of jiggy with it and start gambling. But they'll only do that, and as soon as they get themselves back into a positive chip position, they clam up again. Yeah. And they're so busy protecting because they don't want to feel the loss that they don't gamble to try and get the, the joy. Yeah. But it's, uh, it makes it, sense, though, and it does, you know, it, it sounds silly, but it's not when you think about it, it does yeah, make sense. Absolutely, and they kind of do these silly experiments where they say, okay, if I, you know, we're gonna flip a coin, you, you put in a tenner, and if you get it wrong, you lose it, but if you win it, you lose a tenner. Most people wanted more than their stake to even play. Mm. I'm not gonna flip a coin for a tenner, because it's stupid, I'm gonna lose it. If it was like, well, tell you what, if you lose, you lose a tenner, if you win, you win 25. Yeah. All of a sudden, people are going, that's all right. Yeah. And that's this whole two and a half thing that keeps coming out, is that people want more because my option is to take no risk and I carry on living my normal life, or I sit here and flip a coin with you, and I could potentially win something, and it's like the lottery. It's a bit like working out implied odds. I got no chance of winning the lottery. Well, well I do, but it's so tiny. But the good news is... The prize is, is so massive. My free roll, yeah. I've got to take out 10,000 people. Do I think I can do that? <laughs> Well, someone's got to win it. <laughs> the good news is, if you win it, you get five grand. Yeah. And that's the whole kind of point, is that people will spend a pound for the rest of their lives, every single week, knowing that they'll probably never win it. But if they did, they're going to... It's yeah. amazing. And that's, that's, you know, you overestimate your odds. Even if you know that the odds say you're never going to win the, the lottery, you still do it because... There's the prize is so role. big at the end of it, it's worth it. Yeah, so tell us. You know, we want to know if you, if you have great wins. Write about it. Tell us how proud of yourself you are. We want to hear those stories too. And especially if we've managed to help you. You know, if anything we've said has uh, helped you in your venture, do let us know. It's always great to hear. You know, that's, that's what we're here for, folks. It certainly is. Text number, as always, 62211. And the email address is poker at pokernightlive.co.uk. We also want to know which celebrity or character, non poker related, do you reckon would make a great poker player? And why? Harold says Jack the Ripper. <laughs> because A, he'd be good at hiding the identity of his cards as he's kept his own identity a secret. <coughs> do, do we know who Jack the Ripper is, don't we? I don't know. Uh, the other players would be so scared of him murdering them, they would probably just fall to his razors. So there you go, that one is from Harold. So tell us yours. We had a good one off Chefnick, said Pete Burns, because in live games you wouldn't be able to read him. With a face like that, mm. you wouldn't know what you're dealing with, would you? No, there you go. But Jack the Ripper, apparently, from Harold. Thanks for that one. Keep them coming, folks. Yeah, have a bit of fun on the Saturday. 
Well, send him only now. Well, here we are, meantime, on our full table, down on, down on the 50 cent $1 game. Everyone's still got plenty of, plenty of dosh to throw around. Snap it, picks himself up. A nice little pop, just by betting. Somebody checks your bet, you win. Suited connectors, but forking is not going to do that. He's seen that hurt him too many times, I'm sure. Some reasonably playable hands here. King Queen is not a hand I would personally want to raise up with, but we can see that actually is run into some hands that are likely to fancy a piece of that. Yeah, Jack is called with his suited connectors. Yeah, an Ace Ten. I mean, it's the problem with something like Ace Ten when you've got a raise ahead of you. We know that it's, he's got the best of it, but if an Ace comes down, you go, "Hooray! I've made my Ace." If somebody then bets it, you think, "Oh, hang on." What if he's got ace king, ace queen, ace jack? Crumbles hit two pair, and Jack Alley had yeah a straight draw, but didn't and that fancy you know it. because Crumble bet it up, you know he raised it up before the flop. So when the flop comes down, full of big cards, you know that's the difference, isn't it? And, th and that's where you've got to work on your post-flop play because if Crumble raises up there with king queen, if the flop comes down five four nine, yeah. Is Crumble going to bet out then? And, you know, if people are paying attention, are they going to sense that? So that's when we talk about continuation bets. And it's like, if you're going to try and portray something, don't then give it away. You make a bet before the flop that says, gosh, what sort of hands might this guy go up to $3 with? Yeah. <laughs> These two guys bumped into each other with the same hand. <laughs> Neither of them are hit, but he who bets wins. But yeah, you know, so you make a big, big raise and everyone goes, right, I'm going to put you on ace king, ace queen, a pocket pen. Oh, pocket jacks, da, 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 da. rags come down on the flop, and then this guy is like checking. And it's like, well, I wonder if maybe he didn't hit his cards, you know. And and it, you can do it to slow play, but again, we see it here most of the time. People don't do that. People don't slow play. If if they've hit it, crumble, hit the deck. The it. He put the bet out. Nobody wants to play. Yeah. Which is fair, dude. You know, it's not like oh, he should have slow played it. He should have reeled them in. He made his money with a hand that could have been very easily cracked. So you always got to be thinking one step ahead and you know knowing what you're going to do. Once the flop comes, once the turn comes, once the river comes, you can't just make your bet and think, leave it there. Yeah. You have to be thinking exactly. into and the future. And especially for Crumble there, because he was first to act. So he raised it up, safe in the knowledge that when the flop comes down, the action's going to be on him. What's he going to do? Is he going to wave a flag in the air that says, check, I didn't hit it? Is he going to make a bet that says, I'm representing that I hit it or I did hit it? No, it's just, you've got to be consistent. So especially, unless you've got the nuts all the time, which you don't, then you've got to kind of act like you do. Yeah. Otherwise, anybody paying attention will just go, I'm going to have a piece of you. going to have a piece of you, son. <laughs> now, this is interesting. You've got two Perry hit there. I'm surprised uh, that was as easy as it was. There were sort of two spades and two hearts on the board. Are you a fan of the four-card deck? Yes, very Good. much so. Makes it a lot easier, doesn't it? Spotting those flushes. As we've already fallen foul of missing a hand earlier on, we, we need all the advantages we can have. We wrote off a tourney before we did. <laughs> before it was finished. We, we we even did the we did the flash, we did the shroom. We came back into vision and then we went straight back in. Oh, sorry, it's not it can be done. Yet. Important lesson. See, we actually we did on purpose. I'll let you into a secret now. We decided that in the break that we were going to pretend yeah, we had seen it. Now Grumble might be in trouble here because he reckons he's got the best of it. Yeah. The he's 10 gone. isn't a brilliant kicker, and that bet is scary. Ay! <laughs> Crumble, you lucky devil. <gasps> it is Trip Kings. Well, it'd be interesting to see what SG does yeah. here. It's a bet oh. six. He just flat calls it, which is sensible, kind of careful play. Yeah. He clearly doesn't think that he's got the best of it anymore, otherwise he would have raised up 16 into a 58. Good lay down Good there, mate. Good play by SG there, wasn't it? Absolutely. And that's the truth of it, is when you think you're winning, you make a bet, which he did, and he got called by Crumble, who probably shouldn't have called it, but I understand why he did. And then Crumble, you, and again, that's good by SG, because he thinks, now, what would this guy call me with? Yeah. And he rightly puts him on a king. A third king comes down, and that's all SG wants to know about it. 
Um, I get the feeling SG just called the, the final bet because it was sort of cheap enough and a big enough pot that had an ace came down, he had great implied odds to, to yes. take more money. But when, when it didn't and yeah. he was... And that's the truth is it's a big skill. You never want to say, oh, he just gave it up. But actually that's, that's a, a real key skill is like letting go of money when you're no longer... You've no longer got a good reason to think you're winning. And it's a bit of, you know, all the cliches roll them out, but, you know, throwing good money after bad is not a winning route in poker. And, and money that you've saved is just as valuable as money you win. Because he then, he could have thrown away another 16 bucks. If we're in a bigger game, that might have been, you know, 1,600 bucks. But the money you save is money that's in your pocket if you really don't think you're going to win. So as soon as you don't think you're winning, throw it away. Unless you're up against somebody who consistently bullies you and kicks you around. And the other thing we hear a lot is you have to be able to put down winning hands. What, what do we mean by that? Oh, I don't know. It sounds like shit. <laughs> Why do you put down a winning hand? <laughs> Tell me more. What do you mean? I, I, what are you talking about, I Lindsay? hear that all the time. You have to be disciplined enough to put down winning hands. Well, yeah. You, I guess what it really means is that you've got to be prepared. Because it does well, sound like a contradiction in terms, doesn't it? Well, there, SG has got a winning hand because the board's showing pair of kings, he's got a pair of aces. But he knows that somebody out there could have the king. Even if there was one king there and somebody's making big moves, yeah. well, he's got to think, well, what if the guy's got pocket kings? Does the betting of this round make me believe this guy could have something like it? So the truth is, that, again, it's about risk. And, and this might be, putting down winning hands might be about pot odds. So if there's a dollar in the pot and you've got a good hand, and somebody makes a massive bet against you. If it's going to cost you $100 to win a pot that's got $101 in it. Yeah. Well, what hand is so unbeatable that it's worth putting another 100 in to win yeah. one? Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. an extreme example. But you know what I mean is that you've just got to keep thinking about what the risk is. Because the truth is any hand can be cracked. Um, unless you truly do have the nuts and you know you're unbeatable. Um, but to put down a winning hand, that's all I can think that means. Or if you're, you just if you're hanging not, out with crazy if people. If you're not getting the odds to call. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> Sounds silly. <laughs> I'm sure it was yeah. James, but I don't think he said that to me. Maybe, I, do you know what, maybe there was some specific situation that you've been watching that, that, that led him to say that. Um, the truth is generally it's the case of when the, f if you've got a player that is very good at representing, he's got, if he's got basically a very ballsy player, and the flop comes down, and there are straight possibilities, there are flush possibilities. Just because a player hasn't got it, and you've got pocket aces, yeah. if a guy's betting at you, you've got the winning hand, but you have to lay it down. Yeah. Because it's too much of a risk. Absolutely. And good luck. You know, a round of applause for the guy that's you know, ballsy enough to make your big bet into a sort of a flop like that. Um, but you could, you could get caught. Yeah, that, but again, that's your risk, is that if you're up against... Some, played some games recently with some guys that would just call anything. Yeah. And it really did seem like you're not getting pot odds, the flop is scary as hell, yeah. and you're still calling. Um, and some of the time their hands, you know, they'd have a decent hand, like they might have, I don't know, a pair of kings, a pair of jacks or something, and it would hold up. Yeah. But they were taking quite a big risk, and they weren't really getting that much for it. It was, you know, not as extreme as $100 to win $1, but, you know, you were over betting the pot to make them really like, you know what guys, you've got to be pretty secure in your hand because you're not getting a lot of money back for your odds here. Yeah. Um, and some guys are still cool. So you, you've got to kind of know a bit about your opponents. Because um, if you think, do you know what, I can't even bully this guy. So that, that's, that's my guess of what James might have been talking about, where somebody has made it so unrewarding for you to continue in this, that even if there's a slight risk of you being beaten, even if you are actually holding the winning hand, as we can see, because we see all the whole cards here, Throwing that away is probably the best thing to do. Yeah. And I guess in a lot of those instances, you don't actually know that you've got the winning hand. No, you can't. And you can't, you know, that's the worst thing in the world. You know, you, you do get those, you know, you get a hand where you've been dealt the pocket aces and you haven't had it in weeks. And you raise it up and you get one call. It's exactly what you wanted. You got it heads up. And then the flop comes down, king, king, four. Yeah. And now you're going, can I reasonably expect to have the, the best hand? If an ace has come down, it's not unreasonable to expect to have the best hand. But if it comes down king, 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 <laughs> yeah. you go, well, the guy called my raise pre-flop, can I find it easy to believe he's got a king? Yeah. 
I no longer think I'm winning. And, you have you a know, full house. Yeah, so, you know, so it's, oh yeah, it's a bad example. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, no, because at this because you would have the full house with a pair of aces. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. But he would have quad kings. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe not necessarily expecting three kings to come down, because that lessens the odds of him having the other king. But you know what I mean, is that the flops, the flop can be a right bugger. So I guess you, you, you've always got to be looking at the pot. A lot of people, when they're starting now, forget to look at what's in the pot, how much is it costing them, and what they're going to get back. And again, we said this earlier on, it's all part of your staff worrying about your hands, and then you start thinking about what your opponent's hands are. And this is, you know, it's one of the, the big skills of looking at a flop, is being able to look at a flop and immediately see where the danger might be. Yeah. So it is holding on to pocket aces and two kings coming down. Don't just be going, I've got aces, I've got aces, I've got aces. You've got to look at it. And you don't want to necessarily scare yourself out of playing, but you've just got to appreciate there are possibilities on the board. And if somebody makes a big bet at you, you decide, do I believe they're a player who's got that king? Is it like our boy who's been sitting waiting for a premium hand for the last half hour and now is suddenly betting? Chances are you can put him on a king. Or is it some guy who's been loose as hell and has been caught out all night long yeah. and he's just decided to make a move because he's running out of chips? Well, probably your odds there are to call him. Um, but you know, that's the stage, is that, and then, as you rightly say, and then you've got to start thinking about the pot. I mean, I, again, you've just got to ask yourself some questions. Am I getting value? Do I need to be involved? What's at risk? If it's a tournament, am I about to go out where I could actually survive for another three circuits of the table? Yeah. Yeah, you don't have to, when you first start now, you don't have to know all these, you know, no, great no, mathematical no. odds and, and work things out. You can just, you can look at it and just say, do I think that's good <coughs> value? And just generalise, can't you? When you and that's what I said very early on in the programme, which is, you know, is the more hands you play, and speaking to some of these guys that are pros, they're like, you wouldn't believe, you know, since I, I went pro six months ago, and I play maybe four or five days a week for between three and seven hours. And when you are just playing poker and playing poker and playing poker, you wouldn't believe how much better you get. Just because you just get such a good feel for yeah. your position, you get such a good feel for your situation. Here's a painful one. All in's got himself, he's flopped two pairs, but unbeknownst to him, four king has got the trips. Yeah. He um he's hit the set. He won't be pleased to see that club, I would imagine. And that four is going to make life interesting, That's but a full house, all in a it? slow down. And four king would do well to actually take this check, just, just make use of the river principle. See, you've got to be careful there, because there are other possibilities. It is pretty safe, but there are other hands possible there that could be beating him. But it's, again, we look at the pot, 37, it's going to cost all in $10 to win 37. Three to one. It's a good discipline fold, yeah. And that it's just, it is, as you say, you don't need to sort of get too hooked up on, you know, you know, I've got nine outs and that's 2% per out on the flop. Because to be honest, a lot of the time, that doesn't help you. You go, right, I'm 70%, you know, it's 70, 30. You think, yeah, and? Yeah. <laughs> you know, what is that? If that doesn't actually mean anything to you. But then you can just roughly having, work it out, can't you? Yeah. But it's more about just looking and going, hang on a minute. The guy raised pre-flop, so I put him on a hand. A king is on the flop. He's made a bet. I'm only getting two to one. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not necessarily pure common sense, yeah. but you've only got to ask yourself, right, do I need to get involved? If I lose this, have I got enough chips to carry on? If I win this, have I won so many chips that it was worth risking being knocked out? Yeah. You know, take your time and just, just think it through in English. <laughs> <laughs> you know, use English rather than maths. It's only really when you're playing, well, no, it's not only really, but when you play cash games for long periods, that's where the maths does become more of a dictation because you're working out, I could lose this, but I know that, you know, five times out of seven, this will be a situation that works in my favor. So I'm prepared to consistently get myself into position yes. because I know that more often than not, this is going to work in my favor. And because you haven't got so much to risk in cash games, and if you're a seasoned cash player, you know you're going to go down as well as up, is that you will get into hands that don't necessarily give you fantastic odds, but they give you reasonable odds. Yeah. And you know that if you don't hit, you know, if there's lots of money in the pot and there's money coming your way, I've got to hit some of my cars because this, guy, you know, this guy's got a pair of twos and I need to make my straight. You don't make your straight, that's fine. But at some point in that situation, that will become a profitable situation for you to be in. And as long as it's always more profitable more often than not, 
then in the long run, it's that's worse. somewhere you want to be. Yeah. That's the situation yeah. you want to be in. So you can play it differently, but that's why we had a question earlier on saying, is it more profitable, profitable to play cash than tournaments? Depends what your abilities are. Probably the fact that I'm not Mr. Calculator is why I'm good in tournaments. I was going to say, you, so would you say that you, you probably have to have a better mathematical brain to be a better cash game player than a tournament player? Um, is it more down to the maths in the cash games? Well, it's still, it's still everything we spoke about. It's still, it's still a, a real great overall understanding of everything going on. Yeah. But I think in tournaments, and this is just my personal opinion, I find I can, I can rely much more on my instincts and my, my vibes about other yeah. people. Is I know somewhere in my head that actually the decisions I'm making are backed up by maths because I am aware of, of how much it's costing me to continue. I know what my chances are of yeah. improving the hand uh, if I'm sort of making a semi-bluff or whatever. But I don't really think in those terms. So I think the difference is if you think in numbers or you think in situations, um, you know, I, I don't, you know, you, it's hard for me, I'd love to sit inside Casper's brain where he's like really, really on top of the numbers, he really like, you know, James, you know, they really live in the numbers. Yeah. Um, but I don't see those guys as having an advantage over me, I just think they have a different style or a different approach, or yeah. their brains just work in different ways. They give you different advantages. Perhaps so, yeah, yeah, or, or it might be actually that we both, we both would come to, you know, give us you know, take me and take Howard Ledger or James Brown, any of the guys that are very, very led by the maths they understand. In any given situation, we probably come to exactly the same conclusion. Okay, here's the situation. You've got these cards are in this position. This is what's in the pot. This is about. We would probably both say, I'd throw it away. Yeah. James would probably give you a very different reason but you than come I to would. The same conclusion. But actually, it's yeah. the same conclusion. And it might be because I just say in English, I know that more times than not, I'm not winning. So it's not how you get there. It's James is going to be make. telling about his, you know, his expected value over a period of time and how many hands he would have to play before that becomes a profitable call. Or, do you yeah. know what I mean? But you've actually got the same knowledge ticking around in your head. It just displays itself differently on your, in, your internal screens. <laughs> yeah. um, that's my best explanation of it. But then again, no, it doesn't weird. make sense. It's it's, it's not how you get there, it's what conclusion you come to yeah, and what, what, what calls you make at the end of the day. And you do find, you, you know, you see this, you know, and you see lots of coverage and you've got some guys who are really, they're going to the tank, as they say, you know, they've got somebody who makes a, makes a move against them and they shut down and they're replaying the hand, they're thinking about the mass, they're thinking about those. You've got lots of other guys that would just stare at them, stare in their eyes and say, have you got something? Look at me, have you got something? <laughs> and, and that's the difference is that both those players are probably going to come to in inverted commas, the correct decision. You know how strong you are, how weak you are. But they get there in different ways. Yeah. Some people are just waiting until it feels right or feels wrong, and other guys are working out mathematically, is this, this a positive or negative situation? But the money's moving around the table. Our 50 cent $1 table is by no means quiet or slow, which can be the case sometimes on the cash tables. But these guys are happy to chuck some chips in there. They're getting some really horrible hands and some really horrible flops, but they're all still kind of moving some, sh some chips in and out of the, uh, the pot. All in hits a little pair of fives and makes a move. That turns into three of a kind. Can't imagine SG's going to want to see a showdown. Little bits of money moving around very slowly. Yes. Everyone's swapping money. <laughs> Here's the leaderboard. Yeah, not too much between all these guys. Assuming they all started off with 100, as that's the maximum buy-in, and most people do opt for that. You can see that there's very little movement. No one really running this table over, but no one's going to go home celebrating their huge victory. They're going to say, I made $35. Yes. Let's go to dinner, darling. <laughs> Let's order a pizza, love. Exactly. Just a small one. <laughs> a medium, thin <laughs> crust. Or fancy a pizza. Oh, you've made me hungry. I was just going to say, you've made me hungry now. If anyone's got any pizza they'd like to send in? Mm. No anchovies, please. No oh, no. Or oh, olives. Oh, the olives. The olives are OK. Oh, no. I mean, you can pick them off. Anchovies, I mean, they get right in the mix. They There's get... no in-between with olives. You, you'd never eat an olive and say, oh, it's all right. You either love it or you hate it. There's no, you would never eat an, someone would never eat an olive and go, mmm, that's quite nice. <laughs> you'd either go, oh, you come on and spit it out, or you go, mm, that's gorgeous. Do you not agree? Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> it's one of those foods. Nice.
Yeah, it's fair dues, I'll give you that. <laughs> I'm a, I would spit it out. <laughs> right, I'll make a note of that. No olives. No olives. Or anchovies. Anchovies, yeah. Although I did have, did have some, uh, some fresh olives the other day. Uh, sorry, some fresh anchovies. Much better than pizza anchovies, I must say. Somebody said, no, try one of these. They're proper, proper anchovies. It was very nice. Oh, really? It was just like any other fish. It was like in chicken, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's quite enough about anchovies. <laughs> yeah. So the, so the ones that put on pizzas were obviously out of a tin or something. Yeah. Well, you know, it's cheap, isn't it? Yeah. Cheap food's never as good as proper food. Cheap and cheerful. <laughs> You're making me hungry now. Right, we're going to get uh, some of your emails and stuff now. We've got loads of good text on emails. This one has come through from Ian. Hi, Ian. He says, hi guys and girls, great program, I've been watching now for about six months. I'm still on my original $50, which I put on a few months back, but it's getting a bit low. Just one question really, I only play online maybe, um, sorry, mainly $10 tourneys and won $2 cash games. Every bluff seems to always get called despite using up to five times the big blind. Any idea how I could be playing this better? Well, the truth is probably give the bluffing a rest. Mm. Um, if you're getting called, I mean, I assume you're getting called and getting beaten rather than just like getting exposed. Um, bluffing, you don't have to bluff. You know, bluffing isn't necessarily something that you have to do to succeed. There are times when you want to make a move, but a bluff isn't just about having rubbish and playing as if it's good. Bluffing is more about recognizing a situation or a position where you think, do you know what, the cards aren't so important anymore. It's a real basic example, but you know, everyone's checked round to you. You make a bet. It's not like you're bluffing because you're a crazy guy. It's you're bluffing because you've just sensed weakness and you think that actually a bet's all it's going to take to push people off. The key message with bluffing, it's a really great thing to remember, is that bluffing should be misleading, not confusing. So when you bluff, it should, it should send out a message so you should, make, you should actually make it very easy for people to see what you're trying to say. If you just suddenly make some big random move, that doesn't really mislead people. It doesn't reel them in or like push them away. It just makes them go, what? And then they just think, well, this guy's just crazy. And that's where you're going to get called. So it might be that you need to think about what are you doing when you bluff? Are you just like, you know, you're saying here you're kind of making it a five times the big blind. Maybe that's too much. Maybe that's just sticking out like a sore thumb. Maybe you need to be like in a good late position, nobody's made any moves, and you just make it three times the blind because that's what most people make when they have a hand. I've got ace king, I'll make it three times the big blind. You go five, they think, I don't believe you, mate, because if you had a hand, you wouldn't want to scare me off with five times the big blind, would you? You'd want me in. I'm going to call you. Oh, three, seven. So make a note of what you're doing. I know it sounds a bit kind of like crazy, but write down what you do. What did you bluff with? What were the blinds? What was your position? And what did you do? Because if you're always doing the same thing, you're going five times, maybe five times is not enough. It needs to be either bigger or it needs to be just a bit more basic. But just try to remember, make it misleading, not confusing. Good stuff. Thanks for getting in touch, Ian. I've got an email from Kurt who says, I've been playing poker now for only 10 months and I read books. Watch players at live games and most importantly, watch your show. I know it's not been a long time, but I really want to get better, so I want to know what's the correct balance between online and live play. I aim to play live at least once a week in multi-table tournaments at my local snooker club, but is that enough? I find it's totally different than online, so I want to get the experience, but should I make a greater effort? My main aim is to get to the World Series of Poker, maybe next year. Well, everybody has their hopes. <laughs> Well, the, the the, yeah, if you're expecting to get the World Series of Poker, you will need some live experience. But the truth is, there's no like prerequisite balance. You must play so much live game. Um, lots of people have given up on live because it involves getting out and leaving their house. Why would you do that? You've got all these games on the internet. Um, it depends what you're looking for in this experience. I like playing live games because they're fun. They're more sociable. Play with your chips. Ja, ja, ja. Um, if you want to end up down the World Series, you are going to need a bit of live because it is different between internet and live. But I would start off with something probably a bit smaller than the uh, World Series to kick yourself off with. <laughs> yeah, but thanks for getting in touch, Kate. If you'd like to send an email in, we'd love to hear from you. And don't forget, we want to know what celebrity or character, non-poker related, do you reckon would make a great poker player? Send through to us, 62211, or you can email poker at pokernightlive.co.uk. We're going to take a short break now, but we're going to have the conclusion when we come back after the break of our multi-table tourney. Yeah, going to make some good action there. Good stuff. So stick around and we'll see you in just a few minutes.
Welcome back to Poker Night Live. It's Lindsay and Matt with you until two. Watching a multi-table tournament earlier on, we had about 320 entrants. So some good stuff there. We've not seen the conclusion of that, so we're going to have that coming up. Also, probably a bit more cash. But before we get to a table, get a couple more of your emails and texts. We had loads of good ones tonight. Thank you. Uh, this one is from Blocks, who says, uh, Great show as usual. Earlier on, you commented on my play with three of a kind, sevens against top pair. Remember this? Yep. Um, Jack Alley showed strength by re-raising my raise. I re-raised him back because I put him on something like two pair, so giving him a few outs. I don't like giving anyone the chance to outdraw me. Also, I often find players seem to call re-raises anyway once they've showed strength. So I generally play strong on dangerous boards or against players showing strength. Anyway, can I have your thoughts on a problem which I've got with my game? When I make a raise in late position, I find it hard to put a big blind on a hand, especially if they're a loose player, and I see him as he's just defending his blind. I can get caught in a battle with not much of a hand and losing money. Sometimes I sense he's just flexing his muscles and put in a follow-up bet. Um, I put in a follow-up bet and he calls. I can then get caught donating too much money before I eventually think, ah, maybe I'm beat. Yeah, it's interesting. First, your first point is uh, totally reasonable what you're saying about... Because uh, I can't remember what our criticism was or what, what I said. I think it was because we were suggesting that having uh, a three of a kind in that situation, knowing what sort of hands are generally winning, that maybe the raise was a bit too big to see him off. But actually what you say is totally acceptable, which is get rid of him there. You don't want to give him too many outs. You don't want to give him the opportunity to get more, more cars for free. So that's absolutely fine with you on that one. The second point you make... Um, I think what you're saying is that obviously anybody in the big blind, a bit like where we were trying to discourage people from just making up the small blind because you've got money invested, I'll put a bit more in. Similarly, guys in the big blinds know this. So if somebody in late position makes a raise, quite often they see it as just somebody trying to push them off their random hand they have in the big blind and they will protect it. And it is therefore very hard to actually know what sort of a hand they have because their call of your raise might just be to protect that blind. The only thing you can do, knowing that they are going to be the first to act, and they, if they do make like a continuation bet, they make a bet to make it look that their hand is strong. The only thing you can really do is make a raise, because that really is going to ask them a question, saying, I know you're going through the motions, you've defended your blind, you've made your continuation bet, here's a re-raise. Are you really got a hand that you want to spend more money on, or are you just going through the motions? If he keeps coming back at you, if you keep meeting some sort of resistance, as Mr. Wellthorpe would say, is that you've got to start taking him seriously. Maybe he does have a hand. If you just let him limp in, as it were, on his big blind, it's the same sort of story. Anybody in the big blind, you don't really know much about them because they're either limping in because you've made it cheap or they're just defending their blind. So you're going to have to use betting to ask some questions. If you keep calling, if you let them, you know, if he bets and you call, it's all the stuff we said earlier about you being the passive one. You need to ask some questions, and the only way to do that is to put some chips in. If you're not prepared to do that and you're running up against a player who is prepared to de defend his blind, and it's actually something that a lot of people are weak at, they're in the big blind, somebody raises, Woof. oh, well, I'll just give the money away. I wouldn't have been in interested anyway if I wasn't the big blind. If you're up against somebody who's good enough to know how to defend his blinds, you're probably actually going to have to spend some chips asking him the questions that get you the answers you need to continue. Okay, good stuff. Uh, email from Henry, who says, Great show. Matt has really been giving some good advice tonight. Thank you, Henry. Um, but... <laughs> oh, hang on. <laughs> Oh. It's only a little bit, no, honest. No, I've changed my mind. I'll take that thank you back. Just rewind it before the thank you. It's only a little bit. He said he's got one problem oh. uh, where you advise to make moves early on in the tourneys to accumulate chips. Mm. Uh, he says the way I see it, is that you have to hold some sort of cards to make that speculative play. Unfortunately, if you're picking rubbish up, you don't really have that option. Also, at the early stages, I find it very difficult to lay down my aces, kings, queens, ace, king. So I do tend to play them, even when I face a couple of players going all in. Unfortunately, I am only winning 55% of the time. Not a bad beat story. He says, anyway, I've been watching the show for 10 months now. and My play's improved a lot, so keep up the great work. And many thanks. Okay. Well, taking the last bit first, saying about you're finding it difficult to lay down aces, kings, queens, ace, kings, so you tend to play them even when you face a couple of players going on. Brilliant. Why wouldn't you want to do that? And even though you're only winning 55% of the time, well, that's, that's more often than not then. So you are going to find big hands get cracked, uh, and there are times, you know, pair of queens are nice, but if 
I don't know if you're necessarily talking about pre-flop or post-flop. Obviously, if it's post-flop and there are aces and kings on the board and you're playing queens, then that's easy to give it away. Um, as far as saying about speculative play, you say that you, you need to have some sort of cards to make the speculative play. Yes, you do, but what we're talking about here is playing lesser hands. So I'm talking about, say, 9-10 offsuit. Um, if people are playing quietly and, you know, if people are playing like you're suggesting, if people are waiting for aces, kings, queens, etc., etc., is that they are probably going to be limping in or folding out. So you're going to have a fairly reduced field on your table because you're waiting for premium guys. If anyone makes it cheap enough for you, and only if they make it cheap enough for you, and you're in a late position, that's where I'm saying 9-10 is maybe a hand you have a look at. Because if the ball does hit you, it's probably going to hit you in quite a profitable way. Because you're up against guys who are sitting waiting for their big hands. And if you've got 9-10 and you get an 8 and a jack, you've got some options there. And you're probably up against the guy holding ace and a, a loose kicker. or 5-6 off suit. Have a go if it's cheap. Because if you're starting off with 1,500 in chips and the blinds are at 2550, it's not a huge part of your stack to try and get involved. Because, again, the other problem is if you're just sitting waiting for your aces and kings, people will label you very quickly. And when you do start coming in, you're going to find it hard to pick up action. So I know what you're saying about needing a hand to get involved, but that's actually pretty much a standard play. You wait for a good hand, you try and maximize it. What I'm saying is early doors, when it's kind of cheap to get involved, have a little go if it's cheap enough and you think you can get away with it. If you think that everyone's going to raise the table, you're absolutely right. Play the game that you know. But it's quite good to invest in trying to sow some misleading information. Because if you do play that 5-6 offsuit and it gets cheap as, and you get to some sort of showdown, people aren't going to just say this guy's a rock. As soon as he raises, he's got aces and kings and queens. Um, it's better to do that when it's cheap than a bit later on think, oh god, I better change gears, and now the blinds are 3,000, 6,000, and it's going to put all sorts of pressure. So I understand your point, but I still think there is room to accumulate chips. If you're just trying to survive, that's brilliant, but you might get to later stages without enough chips to actually like, get involved in any more play. If you try and be a bit cheeky early, mm -hmm. get some early chips. Options, that's all I'm saying. Yeah, no, it all makes sense. I but that's helped so. you, Henry. Thank you, Henry. And then. thanks for getting in touch. If you want to ask Matt anything, or you want to send any comments or tell us any bad beat good win stories. We've not had any good win stories tonight. Then you can send them through to us in the studio. The text number, there it is, 62211. Or you can email us as well. And there's the address coming in. Oh, there it is. <laughs> oh, <whoosh -a. laughs> Poker at pokernightlive.co.uk. Right, Matt, guess what I've got. I don't know. Guess what I've got in my, I don't know. In my little pocket. I don't know. <laughs> I've only just got the final table of you the haven't. Major Table Tournament. I yes. Have. So look. Listen to this. There, whoosh. It's a green one. Five players left. So That's it. Is this our final table? That's it. Okay, Five left. folks. Well, we're going to stick with this to the very end because this is the cream of the crop. This is out of our 342. These are our last five. Yep. Um, and this is, these are the guys that have really earned, earned some, earned some uh, wonga here. Because in dosh. fifth place is 205 bucks for their $10 in. Fourth takes a jump up to 273 Then we start getting serious. Third place is $393. Second place is 598 And the top prize, 940 buckaroonies. Nice. Which, you know... Somebody said about what's profitable for ten dollars. You know these guys. You know, imagine, imagine what you've done. You've turned ten into nine hundred. Yeah, it's nearly a thousand. So you've nearly taken ten and turned it into a thousand. That is not an expectation you could really have if you were sitting down at a cash table. So hours for profit. That's amazing. Yeah. But you've got to win it, haven't you? So again, that's the whole you're argument. You're going to win less often. Exactly. You're going to have to accept that you win less often, but when you do win, you get a really big payback. Yeah. In cash games, you're going to win more hands, you're going to win more sessions, you'll walk away with some money in profit, but it's never going to be like one of these big boys. The little Treader's just gone, down to four. We are, well, he took with him $205, mm, so he can't bad. be too disappointed with that. But. Let's just have a look at where we are here. So the blinds are 4,000 and 8,000. Cash has got the cash. He has indeed. <laughs> he's, been our, he's been our leader for quite a long while, so he, he clearly didn't sit, sit back and kind of let it ebb away. Yeah. Um, McCallan 
just shy of 49,000. So, you know, he's, he's got some life in him. I mean, he's not got that many blinds left, but he's got enough blinds left. Um, pair of sevens against a pair of eights. Eights makes the trips. Bang, look, this could, uh, this could be very quick here. Cash has got a massive lead now. Yeah, Miller five, uh, off he goes. And our boy in fourth place gets 273. And that's got to be great news for McCallum there because McCallum was a short stack thinking, oh, good, and just by sitting still and letting some of the other guys yeah. have a quick battle there, he's just jumped, jumped up nearly $100 in uh, prize money. He's on the button. These hands are going to come around very quickly now, and it'd be interesting to see how Cash uh, acts because Cash is clearly very good with a full board of opponents and now we find out what these guys shorthanded players like. He's a three for his straight. Yeah, I can't imagine Fernando's gonna stick around for a no. even oh. the minimum. Uh, see this might just be a move. He might be just trying to suss out something about his opponent here. As it stands, it's actually worked out because I can't imagine he would have raised there other than trying to suss out something about cash and that's lovely. It's Queen on the turn, pushed Hit all his in. Queen and went all in. And it's kind of a good move, even if he hadn't actually made that queen, just to try and keep... Because Cash could very easily bully everyone here. Yeah, he does yeah. So it's almost like you have to sort of stamp your authority. And sometimes players... I'm, I suffer from this, and it's something I've got to work on. I actually tend to do better shorthanded when I'm the short stack. Right. And again, it might be part of that conversation we had about people are more inclined to gamble when they've got less to lose. Yeah. When you go into a situation with a big chip stack, you're so worried about... Don't screw this up. You're winning right now. You've got all the chips. Don't do anything stupid. Whereas when you've got lesser chips, you're like, right, we're going to have to go here. We're going to have to make some moves. We're going to have to get crazy. Otherwise, we're going to die. Yeah. And so you tend to be a bit more maverick and a bit more happy to get creative and bully people and push people around. And he's sitting there with all those chips. He's going to be seriously confident anyway. Don't build his confidence even more by being frightened to play with him. Absolutely, because otherwise, every time he makes a move on you, he goes, because <laughs> he sees you fold. I mean, ooh, ah, here comes Cash now. That's not too shabby. McCallan luckily not deciding that Ace Five is enough to get crazy with. Doubles the blinds back to Fernando, just calls. And luckily, Fernando, he has actually got the top pair. Yeah. Compared to the board, if Cash were to slow play this, he could find himself getting some payoff. But it depends if Cash is that kind of a player. He makes a repeat bet, sixteen, which is what he did before. Doubled the bl big blind. Fernando, I'm afraid your oh. timing's off. You've got an eight, so you managed to uh, survive that one because you picked up your three of a kind. But the call actually wasn't good there. But hey, good luck to you. Welcome to poker. Yes. Do you know what I mean? You'd hardly get the sentence out of your mouth that says you're the underdog, and all of a sudden you hit the uh, one of only two cards left in the deck that you needed. And you're right back in it. And McCallan, I bet he was sitting there going, oh, please bust him out. Yeah. Because he would have jumped up a couple of hundred dollars in the winning just by sitting quietly. I mean, it was the second place. We're sitting there doing nothing. When you... But it's tempting because we've just been watching this for a short while and already you can see that Cash and Fernando are the guys getting busy with it. So McCallan, by rights, might think, you know what? The blinds are really hurting me, but I'm so sure that these two guys are about to, like, kick each other around. If I just keep my head down and let these boys get crazy... I'm going to go from being, you know, right now he is guaranteed to get no less than $393. But if these boys, you know, if Fernando manages to, to bust cash or vice versa, all of a sudden he gets the best part of 600 just by sitting there yeah. and letting these two guys kick each other around. And quite often you can do that. Your attention's focused. Cash is looking at Fernando thinking, if he doubles up, he's got more chips than me. McCallan, yeah, whatever. <laughs> you know, yeah, 47,000, yeah, okay, I'm not too worried about him. Even if, he, even if I double him up, I've still got a massive wad of chips to play with. So Fernando and Cash are eyeing each other up. Uh, aces and jacks with the nine kicker. It's going to be a split pot if Cash goes for it, which is what happens. They both have a pair of ace, a pair of jacks, and because they both had low kickers, kicker being the other, non-sexy card in the hand, yep. the nine on the board uh, comes into play and they split it up. McCallan takes himself up to 55. Two six, not likely to be a hand he's going to uh, invest much money in. No, he's not getting the cards at the moment, is he? But he's, he's sitting tight, so... Yeah, and at 4-8, he can, you know, he can, he can survive a few big blinds before he... You know, the, the key thing at this stage is 
to not let yourself get to that stage where your chips don't threaten the other players. And even for cash, 47,000, if McCallum suddenly went all in against cash, that's, a lot, yeah. that's quite scary. If he gets down to 10,000, then cash is likely to call him with anything just to see if he can knock him out of the tournament and yes. step up a, a spot because he knows that to double him up by a couple of tens of thousands is not going to turn him into a threat. It's not going to make a massive dent in his start, but 47,000 is, yeah, is a good amount. Fives for Fernando. And this is where you do need to start paying attention about what a player is doing before the flop. But it becomes harder because in these sort of hands, because so many hands are coming so quickly, it's a lot easier for you to confuse opponents by changing gears. Yeah. You don't necessarily raise before the flop, even if you've got a hand, so that no one puts you on a hand. So then the king comes down and you bet. You might get a call where otherwise you'd get a fold. So yeah. I mean, it's, it's a lot easier because everyone, when there's a table of eight, everyone's individual moves might go missed. Whereas here, everyone's pretty much totally focused on what's going on. So it's 4 8, here's McCallan. Folds it. What's Cash going to do with this? Raises it 24. Does that mean he's got ace king? Does that mean he's got any hand whatsoever? You know, is that Cash might get away with a few of those. Yeah. Just because no one really knows where they are at this stage. But you can't afford to get distracted for a minute because you've seen no. so many hands now. And, and it just isn't going to take very long at all for the blinds to just chew through you because. You only get one round, you know, when you're it's kind of obvious thing to say, but there being two blinds, a small blind and a big blind, there's only one hand out of every circuit that you're not already committed to a, a sizable chunk of chips. And this is really a stage where the guy on the button can accumulate some decent blinds because you've got 12,000 in the pot before anything even happens. Yeah. Stealing the blinds. Stealing the blinds is, you know, it's worth doing right now. Especially if you're McCallan, 12,000, that's a lot to him at the moment. Yeah, it's a big percent, yeah, cash, 12,000 is not a big percentage of your, uh, your stack, but for McCallan, that's, uh, you know, that's another couple of, well, obviously it's another circuit of the table where you get to wait for some quality, quality cards. Yeah. Single ace is good enough, it's suited, he raises it up. See, this is where actually the, the fact that they're suited does make a difference. It just gives you outs. You're hoping really with a bit like that that you don't get to, to a flop. But if you do, you've got some hearts, you've got an ace. And you'll see that it's very rare when one of these players has got an ace, it's pretty rare that the other player is also holding an ace. So you don't have to worry too much about your kicker. So right now, ace eight is not worried that his kicker's an eight. He's pretty happy that his ace is strong. And of course the other thing is that knowing that this is, well this is actually timed isn't it, these blinds? This was six, Every 12, 12 minutes. minutes. I was yeah. about to say something wrong, but in the ones where it's, um, in the tournaments where the blinds change by every hand, obviously to get through 10 hands at this speed doesn't take very long at all. But these guys are okay because they got the clock. 2-6 is unlikely to call the uh, race to 40,000. Ace, king, ace, three, pair of fives. Well, this could be quite interesting, this could be actually. Good, Fernando, yeah. I think, might raise this up. Yeah. He's going to get all in from McCallan, and then that's going to make cash a lot easier to fold out and let these two guys kick each other around. But I would imagine he was considering ace, three as playable until that. Until that. Fernando point. now, see, that's great because McCallan's got enough chips. Ah, uh, he's got the ace There's the, the turn. aces. Well, there you go. And Cash must be thinking, oh, no. Now <laughs> I've got two players with a decent chunk of chips. Cash wanted Fernando to win that one. He did. All of a sudden, the guy who's been trying to kick for the last 30 minutes now is really rooting that his fives hold up. You do do that at this point, though, when two players go in, you side with one, don't you? Because you want, when Absolutely. they go all in, you want, the, you want one to go out. Absolutely. And you see it in the live tournaments, you know, any of the televised tournaments, there'll be a guy sitting, and all the cameras are focused on player A and player B, and then they'll go all in. And the third player's up on his feet as if he's actually he's not even involved in it. But here's a situation where I could move up. Yeah. And we're talking about moving up from, you know, $500 to $900. Imagine when that's tens of thousands. It's, you know, please knock yeah. each other out. Knock him out. Even though it's going to leave me in a situation where I'm up against a huge chip leader in heads up. Heads up's such a different game. And I've just automatically moved up such a great chunk of chips yeah. in there. Uh, sorry, money in the prize. Prize winnings. Well, that's not Ooh. the worst thing to ever happen to a guy with 6'4 suited. 
Another diamond would really spoil McCallan's day here. Oh, isn't that just cruel? You gonna see a re-raise here? No, is this He's gonna be a nuts. split pot? No, it won't be because the queen in Cash's hand gives him the nuts flush. Right. So it, do it doesn't go just the fact that the ace is on the board, so they've both got an ace high flush. Well, they do have an ace five, but again, it's a bit like the conversation so we had next for card. McCallan. What's his best five cards? It's ace, king, nine, and then the six and four in his hand. Right. Whereas for Cash, it was ace, king, queen. So it goes to the next, it, it doesn't does. just go with the top one. No, right. no, no, no. You work all the way down the, the, the cards until you see who has the stronger. So McCallum's well to fold that there. He must have, it was far too much for him to put in because that would have been the end of his tournament if he'd called it. Well, that's why I was saying, you know, what he really doesn't want to see is another diamond because to have four diamonds on the board, to expect somebody else to have a single diamond is feasible. It's fairly likely, yeah. And the worst thing was the highest diamond he had is a six. So all he needs is for his opponent to have seven, eight, nine, ten, yeah. jack, queen, king. You know, well, actually, the, the, ace, the ace and the king were already down, but there were lots of diamonds that could kill him. If there hadn't been another diamond, the chance of his opponent having two diamonds in his hand, that's really not such a worry. But it is horrible. You know, you hit a nice big hand, you think, finally, and then the board goes and ruins your day. Yeah. Big, mean, nasty board. But is McCallum still um, well in this tournament? Second now. Oh, look at that for cash on the river. He's got his full house. Yeah, king's full of tens. I mean, unluckily for him, Fernando hasn't got a huge hand. That's a cheeky little raise there. It's just a mm. tiny, tiny raise. But that's the kind of thing that actually might be more suspicious than not. Yeah. Fernando, Fernando is similar to think that. They're going, hang on a minute. That's such a dodgy little raise. And what he's trying to do is give him brilliant pot odds. There's 160. In the pot, it's only going to cost you twenty thousand to call, and it's exactly the reverse of the situation we spoke about before, where you make the pot so hideous that you're trying to push someone away. Yeah. What Cash not necessarily did wrong there, but he's trying to get paid off. But what he did there was made the pot odds so good, it just smells it looks, fishy. Yeah. It's like it looked like he's trying you to trap. You look like all you're trying to do is get another twenty grand out of me. Well, McCallan's gone. I'm sorry that we skipped there, folks, but uh, McCallan, who had been hanging on by the skin of his teeth there, has indeed left the building. He does get $393 for his trouble, so he can't be too unhappy. No. But as we uh, expected, we've got Cash and Fernando heads up across the table. Handbags at dawn. Mm -hmm. Heads up. Here we go. Fast and furious now. Exactly. Blinds at 5,000, 10,000. Look at this, it's going to be hand, hand, hand. At least, at least online you haven't got... The worst thing is playing live, especially if you're you know, in a home game or in a private game where you've actually got shuffle, you know, you're self-dealing. Yeah. And you want to give it a good shuffle because it's heads up, it's very important. You get it and you cut it and you riffle it and you shuffle and you spread it out. and you can spend you know, five minutes making sure it's a good shuffle. Deal. Fold. Right. Shuffle, <laughs> deal, ruffle, shuffle, spread. Did you get one of those little machines? Like, oh, My right. dad got one for Christmas. <laughs> we were playing at Christmas and you just put them in and go, great stuff. Exactly. <laughs> it's so much faster, isn't it? But, um, but you know, you, you, you want to be a pro. You know, yeah. We, we used to use the shuffling machines. <laughs> but uh, no, it is quite tedious. And what we'd end up with is, oh, hey, oh, look, oh sorry, just, just to interrupt myself. Oh, he, he must hate that. Um, what we'd end up with is whoever had been knocked out first, the, the home rule game we have is whoever gets knocked out first has to be dealer for the rest of the oh. night. It's a horrible rule and luckily it very rarely happens to me because I've got enough friends who are maniacs that I know if I just sit reasonably quiet for the first 50 minutes one of them is going to be daft enough to knock themselves out. But um, after a while you're all taking it in turns to shuffle because when it gets the heads up you've got a couple of decks on the go. Somebody's shuffling one set of cards while the other's in play. So as yeah. soon as that hand's done, you get the fresh deck in, let them shuffle that, because everyone's just like, get this over and done with so we can play another game. <laughs> I'll stick with my machine. <laughs> Seven, eight, nine, ten, jack. Oh, yeah. well, Cash chose not to call that. And look, these guys have got very, very close to the same chip stack here. Pair of junky hands, jack six, ten, three. Ten, three might just give this up. Yep, full fault. Cash must be thinking, for 
God's sake. What have I got to do? How brilliant have I got to be to get rid of these guys? Yeah, even Stevens now, isn't it? Yeah, as soon as it goes heads up, though, Cash's stack didn't really look all that big anymore. Absolutely, yeah. Fernando clearly uh, siphoned up the rest of McKinnon's chips. Seven to nine. Oh, here we go. Got a bit of action. All in for Fernando. Oh, <laughs> and he makes himself the full house there. Good lord, they are. Look at that bang. Look at All that. of a sudden, Cash has got left, less than uh, McKellen was playing around with for most of the, uh, the short handed period. Fernando's nearly a chip half millionaire. If only it were real. Imagine if all this money was real, <laughs> he must be thinking to himself. It's little cash, look. Down to 30,000. Oh, this, this could be... Oh, poor old cash. <laughs> Where's all your cash gone? <laughs> exactly. He's got ten, Fernando's got ten times the amount of <laughs> cash that cash has. Cash, cash, cash. <laughs> is that how you like to play at the table, is it? Where's all your cash gone? <laughs> I, had some, I actually did have a girl that chanted at me once where I had a, a pair of pocket pair of threes, went all in, she called. I thought, gotcha. But actually she had a much bigger <laughs> three of a kind than me. And so she chanted at me across the table, which I'd not had before, in a who's got the biggest set then sort of way. And I was like, well, how very nice of you to sing at it me while I'm losing. It's hard when you're a Georgie, though. Like, do you know you, what? Yeah, anything, anything that game or anything competitive, you just... Yeah. Imagine yourself in the middle of St. James's Park and it's just very hard. Who are you? Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> right. I'll remember to bring my iPod when we play. <laughs> Anybody sings at me, they get the sunglasses and iPod treatment. <laughs> oh, Cash is going to have to make a move. Look, the blinds are 6 and 12. Cash hasn't even got, <laughs> hasn't even got another circuit of the blinds. He's going to eat them up. 5, 6, see, now he's going to have got to him. go all in. He's got 12,000. Fernando, don't fold it. He's got to do it now, come on. Wait, right. Queen high can win, no fives, no sixes. Four, five, six, mm. seven. Well, he gets himself the straight, but to be honest, he let himself get so low that even by doubling up there, he doesn't really have much more than a, no. a bit of a lifeline. He's going to hope that this next hand, a big hand. Give me a big hand, he's praying to the gods. Queen oh, three versus ace do queen, he's dominated here. But he's got he's to do it, come Fernando, on. Fernando, flat call. What do you think about Fernando? <laughs> What's he going to do? Well, Throw it away. Well, he didn't need to go all in, did he? Well, I mean, and why is Cash not calling that? I mean, most of Cash's chips are in. Queen 10 is better than his previous situation, but Fernando's got the 6 7. He's going to call. He's hit the 6. There's a straight Too draw, and flush draw. He doesn't get it. Cash, well, Cash does very well. He gets 598 for second place. For a $10 buy-in, he managed to knock out 340 other players. Fernando, for $10, gets $940. Well done, Fernando. Excellent. You went up against a big uh, chip leader there, but you uh, prevailed. Definitely. But Cash, can't be too disappointed. $598. I wouldn't mind that for a $10. I wouldn't have a, I wouldn't have a problem with a few hours and $10. Mm. I wouldn't mind that at all. And he was so far in front, wasn't he, when we were three-handed, and then it... Well, that's the way, isn't it? If you can get to heads up, the game just changes dynamics. You need one decent hit, and you take a big chunk of chips. But well done, Fernando. Good win there. Just get an email. Squeeze this one in from Welsh Demon. He says, evening, guys. I'm organising my first live game for tomorrow, and about five others are also playing who have never played live. Hopefully, it's going to be a great experience. I've got a couple of questions. Um, if you can answer them for me, please, Matt. Mainly about heads up, which we've just been watching. I'm sure there'll be a few heads up situations arising tomorrow. Firstly, when you've got a playable hand in heads up, should you stick with the standard three or four times the big blind when betting, or should it be a larger amount? What if your stack is much larger than your opponent? Should you be going all in to steal the blinds, etc.? Also, when you've got a good heads up hand, let's say king nine or eight eight, and raise with it pre-flop and get re-raised, how far would you suggest taking this sort of hand? Would you keep re-raising? And at what point would you just call or take other action? He says, thanks for the great show and all of your tips. OK. Um, well, I hope you have fun. It's going to be interesting. If mm. none of these guys played live games before, really interested to see how that, that works out for you. Um, 
As far as what sort of raises should you be making, the truth is you do need to mix it up a bit with Heads Up because you don't want to be too transparent. Um, you know, in the normal multiplayer game, you get a decent hand before the blind, you raise it up to try and kind of clear the field. You don't want to be too obvious in Heads Up because you've just seen in that game is that sometimes the guys were actually making smaller bets. They were just doubling the blinds to try and confuse the players. If you want to get called, you know, if you've got a big hand, do you want to make it really expensive? Or do actually, do you want to like make tiny bets so they get really good pot odds and you draw them in? The truth is you've got to mix it up a bit. It also, hopefully, by the time you get to heads up, you're going to know something about your opponent. You're going to know if he likes a lot of action, if he only calls with good hands. Um, so you're going to have to apply all the knowledge that you will have gained before you get there to decide whether this is a guy where, to be honest, you're going to have to go in all in. You've got a hand, you go all in. You've got a hand, you go all in. Half the time he's going to fold, but you might get paid off. You might knock him out of it. But don't stick to one plan, because if you go fold, 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 three times a big blind, what's the chance of you getting any action? Pretty minimal. So muck around with it a bit. When you ask about having a good hand, heads up, say a king nine or ace eight, you raise with it pre-flop, and you get re-raised. You've got to decide. If you've got ace eight, maybe you've either got to ask a question of him by maybe re-raising the re-raise. If he still comes with you, you're up against the hand. Do you think he's got a stronger ace than you? Um, the honest truth is, if you're raising before the flop, if he comes back at you, unless you have been bullied around by him, you have probably got to put him on a hand that he wants. But again, you've seen from the heads up that the people's choice of hands, queen 10, king 3, heads up is generally going to be a flip of a coin. So you can't get too precious. You can't play a heads up situation like you can a, a normal scenario. Um, one tip that, that I always give to people is make use of the fact that online, most of the lobbies allow you to play just heads up games. Because most players have a load of experience at playing multi table games, you know, sorry, multi player games. Because everyone that sits down at a table gets experience of playing 10 or 8 players. But unless you're consistently getting to the final, you don't have a lot of heads up experience. And all of a sudden, the one day that you actually manage to get, phew, finally got heads up. I think, my God, I've never been here I before. I do that quite a lot. I love it. I really love playing heads up. And what I'll often do is if I, if I enter for a tournament, and you know, it might not be starting for 20 minutes or even an hour, then I'll play a couple of heads up before that and often end up paying for my tournament entry. Uh, absolutely. I love and, it. And, and it is. It's a, key, it's a key part of a lot of people's game where they fall down simply because it's not something they've got a lot of experience at. And when you do finally get to that point with your heads up, the last thing you want is you thinking, I don't really know what I'm doing. Every time I raise, the guys re-raise me. Da, da, da. You can That's play really cheap ones as well. Absolutely, to get used to and it. it's really worth like getting some practice in. Um, but the problem is, it's so hard for me to say what you should be doing. You're going to have to make a judgment on the night as to the guy that re-raises your raises. Is he smiling and smirking and bullying you around, or do you think you've just run into a hand? The truth is, mostly in heads up, everyone's getting junk. So you can't consistently go, this guy, every time I raise, he re-raises me. He might have just decided, you know, I'm going to do it. Every time he raises me, I'm going to re-raise him, see what happens. Mm. He can't always have you beat, but at some point you're going to have to pay to find out a bit more about that player. But I hope it's good fun. And do let us know. Write in, keep us posted, let us know how it goes. And uh, if you do get down to the heads up, let us know how you get on. Yeah, have a great night. A Welsh demon. Thanks for emailing us as well. OK, we're going to head over to a cash game now. 50 cent, $1. Through the blue window. There, look well, at it. Always, always great stuff on multi-table tournaments. We're always very lucky. They always, uh, I mean, by their very definition, anybody that gets through a, a field of 300 odd players is going to have some some game. Um, and that was a really great example of just how how different it becomes when you get down to the shorthand of the last two three players. So we're here on a full table. It's a cash table. It's a fifty cent one dollar. We got pocket fives on the uh, on the button. He doesn't fancy that though, which is fair news. You can see the uh, the difference in chips there. Again, imagining that everyone probably bought him for the maximum, which was a hundred dollars. So no one's really been uh, taking a kick in. No. And four king ace is a, a familiar name. He's doing all right. And is it is it the place? Um, Beside the button, that's the cutoff. Is that the cutoff? Yeah, the, the, the guy immediately behind the button is the cutoff. So SG there. SG is currently the cutoff. Um, you know, which is a nice position to be in. 
again, as we said before, basically the later in the sequence of play you are, the stronger your position is just because you have much more information coming at you. Coming at ya. Coming at ya. Well, what was that song? Cleopatra. Coming Cleopatra, at ya. that was it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they didn't have a uh, platinum second album, did they? No. As I recall. I'm sure they're all probably having a great career somewhere else now. Who knows? If you're out there, Cleopatra, do let us know. <laughs> Pretty confident we won't hear from them. No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's Loomis, Aunt Sally, Snap It. Familiar faces on Poker Night Live. And thanks again for all your uh, texts and emails today, folks. That was some really good stuff. Yeah, definitely. Really enjoyed them tonight. Our silly little topic. Yeah, I'm afraid. I think we, we I think we hit the jackpot earlier. On. I think Pete Burns with the unreadable face was really the. Uh, we wanted to know which celebrity or, or character would make a great poker player, and why. I've got a text off someone who says, "Q Stark," because with her style, she often managed to draw a royal flush. <laughs> Lovely. Da -da 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 -da. Thank you for that one. <laughs> now Loomis with the uh, fish hooks, pair of jacks, takes it up to four, unlikely to get a call. $1.50. I used to get confused when people used to say cowboys, I used to think it was the jacks, not the kings, because they look like stirrups. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's great. How are you mental? <laughs> <laughs> so, top draw poker theory there coming out of my mouth. Yeah, we're not going to be asking you to write the glossary <laughs> of the next book. <laughs> Pair of cowboys, jacks, brackets, I think. I could be wrong. No, do you know They do look like stirrups, though, don't they? Do you know what? I've never thought that. <laughs> now you say it, I can kind of see that they might vaguely be <laughs> misunderstood. <laughs> That's helped people in which way, Lindsay? No way. Okay, sure. <laughs> I'm just going to very quickly address an email because it's just a real quick point, but I want to make sure we, uh, we answer. This is a, an email that came in from Mark uh, in Saffron Morden. And he was asking about, he's, he's just been playing uh, for fun online for a couple of nights and he wants to play more competitively as soon as he understands a bit more. And he's asked for a quick recap on the betting rounds, especially the number of raises allowed. This is only relevant for, for limit poker, which we don't follow here. We, we always follow no limit where, as the name suggests, there is no limit to, to the amount that you can bet here. In limit poker, if, you're playing, if you were playing here like this was a, if this was a 50 cent $1 limit game, you would only be able to make a raise of the big blind. So if somebody had bet the dollar, you could only raise another dollar, the next guy could only raise a dollar. So that's why it's called limit, because there's a limit on what you can do. And the basic premise is that for every round of betting, you are allowed one bet and three raises. So if here on our table, where the dealer button is, if Loomis made a bet, Aunt Sally raised, Snap It raised, and Obich raised, no more raising could take place. Every other player in sequence could only call that because that's what we call capped. This that is point, limit. This is for limit. Yeah. So in, in the games you're watching here on Poker Night Live, there is no limit like that. Again, because that's the difference between limit and no limit. Um, and if you just remember that, one bet, three raises. It's very rare you'll find somebody that actually goes beyond that. Uh, sorry, as in uh, very rarely are the rules different than, than one bet and three raises. The other question you raised is about can you be outbid due to not enough chips to cover a call? The truth is no. You're never excluded. So you've got 50 chips and you've got an opponent who's got 200 chips. It's not like you can't play against him. The only difference is if there were three players on the table with 200 and you only had 50, if you got involved with a pot with all of those players, you can only ever get your stake back. So if all four of you are in the pot, mm. you've only got 50 chips. That means you are only eligible for 50 chips from player one, 50 chips from player two, and 50 chips from player three. That would form the main pot. The fact that these other guys have more chips than you means that they can enter into a side pot. So they can still fight out amongst themselves, but you are not eligible for that money because you couldn't cover it.
So it's, and this is, this is not a stupid question because so many people ask this when they're starting, yeah. is that somebody bets 100, well, I've only got 25, so I can't play. You can play, it's just you won't be eligible for that full amount. You can't win more back than what you put in, that's, that's the thing. But you can't be outbid and, and you know, you're still allowed to get involved Absolutely. in that part. Absolutely. The difference is obviously that if you're playing in, uh, in a tournament scenario, then obviously the difference is there, that he's putting you to the test of, well, you can play in this, but you're going to be all in. I'm not all in. I've, I've got 100, you've only got 25. I'm safe as. Even if you call me in and I lose, I'm still in it. But that's part of the pressure. So, no, you can't be outbid, but you're never going to be eligible for more than you put in to start with. And it starts getting confusing, and a lot of, you find a lot of guys, when you're playing a home game, it gets confusing because you start working out side pots. The easiest way is you start off with the smallest number of chips. So Lindsay's only got 25, and there's six of us in the pot. 25... Everyone in that pot, take 25 out, and that's her pot. I only had 50. 50 out of everyone's pot, that's all I'm eligible for. But that's the way it works, so you know, you can't get out of bid, but you can run out of money. And if they need to, they'll make more than one side pot, won't they? Absolutely. You can, you know, uh, if you get, you get one of those crazy hands where, I, I played an amazing hand once in the, in, the, in the Luxor in Vegas, and in sequence, four of us all went all in. The guy to my right went all in, then I went all in over him, and another guy went all in, another guy, oh my God, this is crazy. And the dealer was just like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> you've got to work out, right, what are you eligible for? And there were just all these piles of chips around the room, and it was crazy. The guy, the guy showed a pair of uh, jacks, I had a pair of queens, the guy to my left had a pair of kings, and the guy at the end had a pair of aces. And the place went ballistic. <laughs> and literally, I mean, these dealers, how many hands do they say yeah. every day? And literally every dealer from every table was just going, oh, my God. Because everyone that showed their hands... The guy with the jacks is going, well, I kind of like my jacks. And I was like, gotcha, for a queens. And the guy, I got you, kings. And the sad Everyone thing was... Everyone was gasping. It when was, the it was. It was and it progressively got more and more ludicrous <laughs> as it went around. And the saddest thing was the guy on the far end of the table that had the aces actually was the guy with the least amount of chips. Right. So he could have made a fortune because he could have quadrupled up. Yeah. But as it went, they won the hand, he took his share... And then the guy with the kings to my left actually then took the rest of it and we were all just flabbergasted. But the place <laughs> just went bonkers. But it can get confusing. But if you are running home games and that's the place you find, because it sounds a bit stupid, but when you're beginners, the fact that one person, you know, player one goes all in, that's scary. If player two calls it, in most games, you're never going to find anybody else wants to get involved in that because you know you're facing some big hands. When you're beginning, everyone wants to play. Yeah. And you do end up with these pretty crazy hands. But that's the way to remember is that <laughs> whoever has the smallest amount of chips, work them out first and then work your way around and you'll, you'll find soon enough that, it, that it's, you get to grips with it very quickly. And as, as far as betting rounds go, there's, there's four betting rounds. There's one before the flop comes down. Yes, absolutely, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, betting rounds-wise, yeah, in... Uh, Oh, obviously, we only, we only focus on Texas Hold'em here. There are different games with different rules, but yeah. There's a betting round. Everyone gets their two cards, and there's the first betting round. Then once that's completed, and this is imagining that there's betting till the end, but imagining everyone's still in it. The flop comes down, second betting round. Fourth card comes down, another betting round. The river comes down, final betting round. Yeah. So there's plenty of opportunities to lose your money. I say Limit is very different. Actually, funnily enough, a bit earlier on this afternoon, I played in a Limit, Limit tournament, which I've not played in for a while. And you forget how different the game is when you don't have the ability to really bully people. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's quite restrictive. And it, and it is, and it's, and it's almost horrible, because also it's very hard to push people off. You know, you pick up a pair of queens here, you make a massive move. In Limit, all you can do is double the bet. So it's like, well, it was $1 to call, now it's $2 to call. People will be calling with anything, so it's a very different game. Um, but No Limit has become popular just because of all the televised tournaments and because it's such a you know such a great aggressive fun game to play. But it's worth you know as you as you play and you learn more, it is worth playing some of these other games. Omaha High Low, but a stud. All sorts of games. They can improve your overall appreciation of the sport. Yes. 
So I did enter an Omaha game by accident once. <laughs> I wasn't watching what I was doing and I did freak out. It is, you know, it's I so really common. I really did. I actually sat there going, ha, 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 what do I do? And then I thought, well, I've paid for it now. I might as well try and play it. And I, it was just an absolute disaster. Do you know, the number of times I've done that and, and the number of times I've actually done really well as a result of it. But I actually got into a game the other day. I went to one of my regular clients and they'd up updated their software. And what I hadn't noticed was, I thought, oh, there were some colours that changed on the menu or something. But there were some new games, but I hadn't noticed. And I played this game, and I'm playing Hold'em, and every hand, I'm getting the most amazing hands ever. I'm getting Ace-Jack, Queen-Queen, King-King, Ace-King, da-da-da. And not only am I getting amazing hands, but the flop is hitting me every time. Yeah. There are Kings and Aces and Jacks, there are Queens and Kings. And I'm thinking, this is crazy. And then after about six hands, I thought, I've got to say something. And I just put something in the chat box, and I was saying, yeah, this is... And it was Royal Hold'em. It was a new game, the side pot, right. where they only used tens up to aces. Right. So there were no cards in the deck <laughs> under ten. Straights didn't count, and flushes didn't count. Because a couple of times, I thought, I've got the nuts flush. And I was getting beat by a guy with three of a kind. I thought, I must have misread that. But I was so dazzled anyway. <laughs> yeah. And then somebody said, no, this is a different game. So what is it called? Royal Hold'em? Royal Hold'em. Flushes don't count. Flushes are worthless. Straights are worthless. Only straight flushes are a, a power right. hand. And only cards 10 to ace were used. <laughs> so no wonder I'm getting great hands, because there aren't, there aren't any rubbish cards left. But it did <laughs> seriously take me about four or five minutes of just going, this is the best game I've ever but you played. You can't have I've many never... people playing because there's not that going to be that many cards in the deck. So if you had a massive table of people, well, exactly. But it was only, you know I sat in a short-handed game as I, I generally sort of play in short-handed games anyway. So I just thought this is amazing. But I just thought this is incredible. I've never had so many good hands get outdrawn. <laughs> Every time I had Ace Jack and the board came down Jack Jack King something, the other guy had Trip Kings or the four. I was like this. I did feel stupid, but so. Just learn from that. Learn from Lindsay's Omaha tournament yeah. and from my own Royal Tour. Do check you know where you're going. It's so easy to do though, isn't it? Because some of them can look quite confusing with all the yeah. different games and, on and them. And I think they're learning because now you get many more filters. Yeah. So you can say, only show me live games, only show me empty tables, only show me this, only show me that. Um, and I think people are going to learn from that, as our friend Snappit gets himself pocket rockets. But um, the other thing is, obviously, as the lobby is kind of self-correcting as games start and move around, you're just about to click on a game and it changes. But be careful. Well, Snap it's doing right here. Got a pair, pair of aces. Now ace 10. Yeah. Queens for Charlie. Queens just limping in. I don't like queens just limping in because that's the kind of board you don't want to see. You're not too happy about the two eights, but with queens, I learnt it really early on. I remember one of my first live games and I just kept getting punished. There was a guy with queens who would just go all in. I'm like, don't you want to make any money out of those queens? Yeah. It's like, I just don't want to get outdrawn. How many cards can like ruin my day? And NSG thought it'd be worth paying just in case he made the flush. There we go. There we go. Leave that cash game now. I'm going to get a couple of emails, Matt, before the end of the show. I've got one on Trev. He says, you wanted to hear about big wins. Oh, good. This could be a nice way to end the show. He says, well, I started playing poker in June last year on the internet. Three months later, I won a big free roll. The qualifiers went to a final, um, then won the final. The prize was a $10,000 seat into the UK Open, where 108 players put um, 10,000 in each to play for 1.08 million. Each day uh, had a six-seater table for the heat, which was televised, with just the winner going through to the semi-finals. My heat included Howard Plant and Ronnie O'Sullivan. Well. The heat was two days after the free roll. I had never played live poker before this. <laughs> Goodness me. I was doing fantastically well, playing very tight. Um, what's that mean? <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Which got me into second position with four players left. Then there was a hand. I was on the big blind. Everyone folded to Mike Comer, who was the big chip leader on the small blind, who made up the big blind uh, with two diamonds and five of diamonds. I checked with ten of diamonds, king of diamonds. The flop came, which was two, eight, ten, rainbow. I had top pen, he had bottom pair. He made a bet, 
and I put a big raise in to take it down. Unfortunately, this is where my inexperience of live poker punished me. Mm. I made my bet with two hands and a string bet was called. Uh. I was only allowed to call, giving my opponent a free card. He had a two on the turn to get trips against my top pair. He confirmed later that he would have folded if I hadn't been called on a string bet. He put a big bet in, just under my stack size, and I'm sure that he was trying to bully me off the hand because of my mm. error. I went all in, two cards to save me on the river, and neither came. It was a fantastic experience, but a terrible way to go out. And you can be sure that I'll never make a string bet again. Now, brilliant, excellent story, fantastic yeah. result. String betting, just quickly, because this is something that, that, again, all the things that people that play on the internet like don't expect to have to worry about is a string bet. Now, I'll just show you. I want to go all in with all these chips, OK? I want to go all in. If I could come back to the main camera, please. Thus chips. <laughs> if I want to go all in, move them in one place. If you go, right, I'm going to raise. That's what a string bet is, is that if you move that forward, and then come back for more. They're only going to accept the first chips you put forward. And the reason for that is because if I'm going to raise Lindsay, I go, I'm going to raise you, and I put some, and I see how nervous she looks, and then I keep doing it, then this is not really fair for me to do it. Because yeah. I could just keep doing that until sweat starts dripping down the forehead. So the whole point is that you say, the best thing to do if you want to play live is announce exactly what you want to do. Because whatever you say verbally, if you say, I'm going to raise 2,000, if you then do it in bits and bobs, doesn't matter because you've already said what you want to do. So my key advice is just vocalize. Unless you're going, raise 2,000, mm -hmm. because you've got a pair of aces. Make sure that you either move all your chips in one go or make it vocal because then no one can misunderstand what you're doing. But great story and congratulations great again. Story, that's far. Amazing stuff. Definitely. I've got an email though. This is, uh, this is from us, or people in the back. Something really exciting I want to tell you about before the uh, end of the show. Um, it's to celebrate PokerZone's new channel position, which is going to be 843, and it's moved to the gaming and dating section of the Sky EPG. We're going to offer one lucky viewer the chance to represent Poker Zone as a roving reporter in Las Vegas at the 2006 World Series of Poker. How cool is that? We're looking for the best quirky poker-related Lonely Hearts column adverts. For example, well-stacked gentleman seeks loose player for some all-night action. <laughs> the wittiest and most original entries will be shortlisted before an overall winner is announced on February the 28th on a dedicated episode of Poker Night Live at 10 o'clock on the new channel 843. So we want your entries to lonelyhearts at pokerzone.tv. That's lonelyhearts at pokerzone.tv. The competition will close at midnight on the 25th of February. What a brilliant prize. Fantastic prize, guys. Get there, get creative. Get them in. But thank you for watching. Have a great uh, night tonight. Really enjoyed it. Smashing. Poker Night Live back tomorrow from 10 o'clock. Make sure you're tuning in. But for now, good night from me and Matt.